Finance Committee meets this morning for its first hearing on the climate crisis in 12 years. It comes right on the heels of President Biden's announcement of an ambitious new climate goal, cutting emissions at least in half by the end of the decade compared to 2005 levels. The target comes with big challenges, starting with energy-related emissions as well as transportation. The reality is a debate on energy and transportation is largely a debate on tax policy. That puts our committee in the driver's seat when it comes to job creating legislation that addresses head on the existential challenge of the climate crisis. The energy tax code in America is a cluttered, outdated, old heap of more than 40 different tax breaks for 80 energy sources and technologies, including witnesses, clean energy and transportation. Most of those incentives are temporary. That keeps clean energy businesses and workers living in an uncertain state of limbo. On the other hand, at the base of the system are century old permanent tax breaks for oil and gas companies. No uncertainty for them. They get guaranteed benefits funded by American taxpayers each year. At a time when Oregonians and Americans everywhere are routinely clobbered by the disastrous effects of the climate emergency, it's important to be clear about what this broken, crazy quilt of energy taxes means in practice. Under the laws on the books, taxpayers in America are subsidizing the climate crisis. That's what it means when fossil fuel interests get special permanent breaks above and beyond what's available to everybody else. There's a taxpayer subsidy for megastorms and terrible floods along our coastlines and waterways. There's a taxpayer subsidy for massive wildfire infernos bigger than any decades ago. There's a taxpayer subsidy for wintertime bouts of extreme cold that send the privilege fleeing to tropical resorts while their neighbors freeze to death in their homes. What's worse, taxpayers are also on the hook for much of the cleanup after those disaster strikes. Last week, I introduced the Clean Energy for America Act that would throw the old set of more than 40 tax breaks in the dustbin. This bill now has more than two dozen Senate sponsors and would replace the old hodgepodge, the old hodgepodge of tax breaks with a new set of three incentives, one for clean energy, one for clean transportation, and one for energy efficiency. We believe this is the right policy because the emissions-based approach also can work hand in glove with the smart fresh ideas that several other members of the Finance Committee are going to discuss today. In terms of tax certainty and predictability, it would level the playing field for everybody. It would be a job creating free market competition to get to net zero carbon emissions. Clean energy producers and businesses that focus on cutting edge transportation would no longer have to worry about their tax incentives disappearing because Congress is yet in another deadlock. The bill helps to supercharge innovation in clean transportation and energy storage. That's a big reason why a new coalition is lining up behind the Clean Energy for America Act. You've got folks from the environmental community, the Environmental Defense Fund, the Sierra Club, the Natural Resources Defense Council, folks from uh, union groups uh, led by the building trades, and the Edison Electric Institute representing utilities of all sizes. They've all announced their support for the Clean Energy in America Act. It's a new coalition for a new day. There's a big opportunity in the months ahead to pass this legislation along with investments that powered the United States over the last century. It's essential to make sure that nobody is left behind in the process of tackling these challenges and moving to clean energy. 
The Clean Energy Act for America is the right approach for high wage, high skilled jobs. It's the right approach for addressing the existential threat of the climate emergency. It's the right approach for promoting innovation and competing with companies in China and around the world. If the Congress doesn't work hard to create these jobs in America, other countries are going to grow in our expense. And to be clear, under the Clean Energy for America Act, what matters, what the bottom line is, is reducing emissions. A nuclear plant or a gas or coal plant that fully captures its emissions would qualify for the same amount as a wind or solar farm. The goal here is not to pick winners or losers, it's to reduce carbon emissions and do it in a way that drives investment and jobs. Today's an important day for the Finance Committee. We uh, appreciate our excellent witness panel for joining us, and let's now turn to Senator Crapo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this timely hearing. The tax code, as you said, plays an important role in the economy and jobs in the energy sector. Energy incentives have the potential to grow our economy and create jobs if executed properly. A number of energy-related policy areas have the potential for bipartisan agreement. And I look forward to working with Senator Wyden to develop that agreement. While there are not a lot of specifics on President Biden's energy tax credits in the American Jobs Plan, he is clearly proposing to increase the corporate and international tax rate and penalize the oil and natural gas industry through the tax code. We must understand the impact of this proposal on the 10.9 million American jobs in the oil and natural gas industries that pay on average seven times the federal minimum wage. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, their policy expertise and their understanding of how President Biden's proposal will either grow or shrink good paying American energy jobs. Prior to the pandemic, the United States was experiencing one of the strongest economies in decades. With the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in place and an agenda focused on smart regulation, we saw progress for all Americans, including record low unemployment rates for African Americans, Hispanics, and others, 50-year lows in overall unemployment, robust wage gains skewed toward lower wage earners, and record high household incomes, followed by record low poverty. Considering the setting of the cost of energy provisions with a corporate tax rate increase or increasing international taxes, especially during a pandemic, is counterproductive and a non-starter on my side of the aisle. It will be increasingly challenging to return to an economy as robust as we saw before the pandemic with endless streams of tax hikes and actions by the administration, such as revoking the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. The Biden administration's revocation of the presidential permit for Keystone XL's pipeline was short-sighted and eliminated over a thousand jobs the majority of which were unionized. I'm willing to work on constructive proposals to modernize and innovate our nation's energy production, while not adversely affecting the millions of good paying American jobs and the existing energy sources necessary for a comprehensive, affordable and reliable domestic energy network. We should discuss ways to improve and potentially expand incentives to increase domestic energy production and manufacturing. However, it's important that we also consider the effectiveness of existing incentive, incentives. Congress should not be picking winners or losers every year when temporary credits expire. We must assess whether these credits continue to be necessary or whether they have served their intended purpose of incentivizing growth and investment. Yet we continue extending credits of technologies that have achieved a significant market presence in the United States and inefficient use of taxpayer dollars. While I support Congress taking a neutral approach to energy tax credits, we must consider whether some of these technologies continue to require assistance and ensure we are designing the tax code to be fair and effective. Our tax code should incentivize technology-wide clean energy innovation, helping to bring breakthrough power generation to deployment until they can compete independently in the market. My technology inclusive bipartisan energy tax proposal, the Energy Sector Innovation Credit or ESIC legislation would accomplish this by working with experts at the Department of Energy, national labs and other stakeholders 
to target tax credits for innovative, clean technology industries. In addition, ESIC would implement a credit phase-down system based on market penetration, systemically reducing credits as technologies increase their market share, instead of allowing Congress to pick winners and losers. I thank Senator Whitehouse for leading this proposal with me in the Senate. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working collaboratively with, collaboratively with you through the committee process to strengthen U.S. energy competitiveness by rapidly scaling and diversifying innovative, clean energy technologies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank my, my Northwest uh, uh, colleague, and, uh, and I want everybody to understand that I think there's an opportunity for the members of this committee to come together. The bottom line has got to be reducing carbon emissions. That is something that I think Americans and every nook of this cranny care deeply about, and I look forward to working with my colleague um, on it. Our first witness is going to be Mr. Jason Walsh, uh, Executive Director of the Blue Green Alliance. Our next witness from my hometown will be Ms. Maria Pope, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Portland General Electric. Our third witness will be Mr. Alex Brill, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Our final witness will be Mr. Kevin Sunday, who's the Director of Government Affairs for the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. We thank all of our witnesses as is customary. Your prepared statements will automatically be paid, made part of the record. And uh, if you can summarize your views in five minutes, uh, that would be good. Mr. Walsh, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Jason Walsh. I'm the Executive Director of the Blue Green Alliance, a national partnership of labor unions and environmental organizations. On behalf of my partners and the millions of members and supporters they represent, I want to thank you for convening this important hearing. It's our belief that Americans shouldn't have to choose between good jobs and a clean environment. We can and must have both. We are in a unique moment to address the climate crisis and create good jobs as we work to rebuild our economy and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. The federal tax code is vital to supporting clean technology deployment. We can also use it to ensure equity in the transition to a clean economy by maximizing the benefits of job growth in that economy for all American workers and for communities disproportionately impacted by pollution, deindustrialization, and job loss from incumbent energy sectors. The science is unambiguous that our climate is in crisis and action is required. We have to get to net zero emissions by 2050 and ensure we're solidly on that path by 2030. Clean energy investments will be central to accomplishing our climate goals. These investments already spur economic growth and significant job creation across this country. At the same time, not enough of the new jobs that have been created in the clean energy economy are high quality family sustaining jobs. We need to do better. As we continue to use the tax code to catalyze necessary investments in clean technologies and energy efficiency nationwide, we must ensure that these investments translate into strong domestic supply chains, high quality jobs, and accessible pathways into those jobs, including for workers that have historically been underrepresented in the energy economy. To this end, we'd like to make three recommendations to the committee, which I elaborate on in my written testimony. First, Congress should extend and strengthen clean energy tax credits, including those for onshore and offshore wind, solar energy, clean transportation, grid modernization, and energy efficiency. Congress should couple these tax credits with standards that ensure the use of domestic, clean, and safe materials made by law-abiding corporations throughout the supply chain, and support employers that adopt high road labor practices, including prevailing wages, protection against worker misclassification, and the use of registered apprentices and community benefit and project labor agreements. We look forward to working with this committee on Chairman Wyden's Clean Energy for America Act, which outlines a very promising technology neutral approach to clean energy tax policy that would reward carbon abatement and spur the deployment and innovation of low and no carbon technologies. Importantly, this bill includes prevailing wage and registered apprenticeship utilization standards. Second, Congress should invest directly in manufacturing and clean energy supply chains. Policies that increase the demand for clean technology must go hand in hand with direct investments to support and grow American manufacturing. Congress can help accomplish these goals by renewing and robustly funding the Advanced Energy Projects Tax Credit, 48C, 
We think 48C can also be strengthened along the lines of the American Jobs and Energy Manufacturing Act, sponsored by Senator Stabenow in Manchin, in which qualifying projects must meet key labor standards and are targeted to support investments in the communities that have lost jobs in manufacturing, mining, or power generation. Congress can also adapt the 45M technology production tax credit to fund domestic production of strategic clean energy and vehicle component technologies. Coupling such a PTC with other manufacturing and deployment incentives could help reverse decades of disinvestment, offshoring, and inconsistent manufacturing policy that has weakened the competitive edge we once held in clean tech manufacturing. Third, Congress should support a job sustaining transition to clean vehicles. Consumer incentives stand to play a significant role in shaping the shift to electric vehicles and the manufacturing jobs and community impacts of that transition. The existing 30D consumer tax credit should be updated to support domestic assembly, domestic content, and high road labor standards. The structure of the credit must help retain and grow the next generation of high skill family supporting jobs in the US and support the growth of domestic electric vehicle production and supply chains. In closing, let me reflect on the reason this committee is gathered here today, which is to discuss the tax code's role in creating American jobs, achieving energy independence, and providing consumers with affordable, clean energy. I'm here to argue that we can achieve all of these policy goals uh, while also ensuring that workers are paid fair wages, that we support and grow American manufacturing, and that communities that have too often been left behind in our economy can share fully in the benefits of clean air, clean water, and middle-class supporting jobs. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Walsh. And I would just like to note for the record that the Blue-Green Alliance was for coalition building before anybody knew it was cool. And I thank you very much. And we look forward to working very closely with you. Our next witness will be Ms. Maria Pope, President and Chief Executive Officer of Portland General Electric. Ranking Member Crapo and members of the committee. Um, I am honored to testify today on the critical issues of climate change, jobs, and effective clean energy tax policy. Climate change is having very real global impacts and greenhouse gas emissions must be dramatically reduced on an economy-wide basis. It will take all of us working together to make a difference. Portland General Electric is a fully integrated utility. We serve roughly half of all Oregonians and three quarters of the state's industrial and commercial activity. We share our customers and our community's vision for a clean, reliable, and affordable energy future. We have ambitious climate goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with the power we serve customers by at least 80% by 2030, with an aspirational goal of zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2040. We are not alone in our emissions reduction work. The Edison Electric Institute's members representing the nation's investor-owned utilities are collectively on a path to reduce their emissions by at least 80% by 2050, and many companies are pledging even faster, more aggressive timelines. As of 2019, the U.S. power sector has reduced its CO2 emissions by 33% below 2005 levels. Advancements in policy, regulation, technology are needed to meet these emissions goals while maintaining reliable service at reasonable prices. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we have a decade to make significant progress to curb greenhouse gas emissions. Utilities or any sector of our economy cannot achieve these ambitious goals alone. The climate crisis will require substantial investments and federal policies that serve everyone equitably, maximizing both benefits to customers and the deployment of a wide variety of clean energy resources. The right technology neutral incentives will accelerate this transition and activate all players to make significant investments. To do move forward with speed requires new thinking, which is exactly what we see in the Clean Energy for America Act. Chairman Wyden, I want to thank you and your team for this thoughtfully crafted bill. The legislation provides tax incentives to address many of these issues and motivate everyone, utilities and independent developers alike, to transform how electricity is generated and used. Portland General Electric enthusiastically supports this bill and we urge its enactment. 
critical to PGE in the utility industry is the optionality between production and investment tax credits, while also allowing utilities to opt out of normalization requirements for the new energy storage credit. These provisions ensure that the full benefits of tax incentives are passed through to customers and that regulated utilities will not be disadvantaged, leveling the playing field to accelerate deployment and ensure affordability for all customers. Along with affordability, preserving reliability is essential. Dispatchable clean resources will play an important role. So will a smarter grid that can harness electricity from wind, solar, and other storage resources when they're available and store that energy for when it's needed. We appreciate that Chairman Wyden's bill provides tax incentives for standalone energy storage facilities and new clean resources that provide important capacity. Additionally, the option to elect direct payment of these credits enables broader use and lower costs savings that can be passed directly on to customers. The legislation requires that eligible facilities must be built by workers who are paid prevailing wages. We value our partnership with labor, including the IBW and PG supports this requirement. I'm pleased that the Blue Green Alliance is here to discuss their perspective. Today, the transportation sector is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. The bill's tr clean transportation credits enable transformational change, encouraging purchase of electric vehicles and investment in critically important charging infrastructure. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to express my appreciation for your thoughtful legislation. Your long-term technology neutral approach enables all parties participation in a path to decarbonization. This is vital as we work together to bring about change. Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, committee members, thank you for your time. I look forward to working with you as you craft these essential policies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pope. And what is little known is our wonderful Oregon witnesses at these hearings have to be up very early in the morning in order to participate. And we very much appreciate PGE's focus, not just on being here today, but on a relentless assessment that this ball game is all about reducing carbon emissions and i know we'll have some questions um, for you in a moment our third witness will be mr alex brill resident fellow at the american en uh, enterprise institute thank you uh chairman wyden ranking member of crapo and members of the committee my name is alex brill and i'm a resident fellow at the american enterprise institute thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's important hearing on the tax codes role in our country's pursuit of clean energy and energy efficiency. Let me begin my remarks with a comment on jurisdiction. As others have noted as well, it's my strongly held view that lawmakers' interest in curbing CO2 emissions and addressing climate change is best handled through policy that can be adopted by this committee. Other committees may have energy in their name and important agencies may have regulatory authority over these issues. But the tax writing committees, the Senate Finance Committee and the House Committee on Ways and Means are uniquely situated to drive market-oriented change that reduces carbon emissions and encourages innovation in low carbon, renewable and energy efficient technologies. The tax code is a powerful tool. Time and again, taxes have been shown to affect decision-making by businesses and individuals. For this reason, basic principles of tax policy argue for a broad-based, simple, transparent tax system that treats like activities alike and keeps tax rates low as possible. There are exceptions to these principles. Tax policy can be effective at intervening when markets are imperfect, and energy is one such example. Because the environmental and economic costs of carbon emissions are not reflected in private transactions between producers and consumers, it's appropriate that policymakers use the tax code to encourage clean energy and energy conservation. The historical approach has been to enact tax preferences to encourage specific forms of clean energy or to encourage specific types of energy efficiency. But tax subsidies can be and often are costly, 
complicated, overly narrow, overly generous, and non-neutral in a technological sense. It's simply impossible to appropriately and efficiently subsidize every energy saving tool or activity. Most subsidies are temporary, and this creates costly uncertainty for many taxpayers. The better option from an economic policy perspective may carry some political baggage. I'm here today to encourage the committee to give it fair consideration. A price on carbon or a fee on polluters, a carbon tax, whatever it's called, is a superior policy to subsidies. Though I would also note that these approaches are not mutually exclusive. A carbon tax is technology neutral and encourages shifts away from carbon intensive sources of energy while encouraging energy efficiency and conservation, as well as research and development in new technologies. It's the climate policy endorsed by thousands of economists, both Democrats and Republicans, including four former Federal Reserve Board chairmen, 28 Nobel laureates in economics, and 15 former chairs of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Most recently, it's earned the support of the business community as well. A carbon tax would increase the rate of return on energy efficiency upgrades, encourage the utilization of more fuel efficient vehicles, reduce miles traveled, and drive many, many small and modest adjustments in the choices made by consumers, manufacturers, and others on their business consumption, on their energy consumption, rather. And revenues from a carbon tax can be used to avoid other tax increases or to offset other taxes that are more distortionary. Speaking of tax increases, let me conclude with a final observation. The tax policy least likely to promote economic growth and competitiveness in the United States is an increase in the corporate tax rate to 28%. Such a change would raise the cost of capital for all corporations widen the disparity between debt and equity financing, and place the U.S. first among OECD nations in the combined state and federal corporate marginal tax rate. A carbon tax could raise the same amount of revenue while avoiding all these pitfalls and efficiently and effectively reducing CO2 emissions. I urge you to give it a fair look, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brill. I know we're going to have questions for you in a moment. Our final witness will be Mr. Kevin Sunday. Uh, Director of Government Affairs for the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. Thank you and good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, Honorable Members of the Committee. Appreciate the opportunity and privilege to appear before you this morning. My name is Kevin Sunday, Director of Government Affairs for the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. Our state is blessed to, in many respects, be a microcosm in the United States, whether that's a rural versus urban split or average age, income, education, political affiliation. But where we are not average is on energy. Pennsylvania is the number two state for natural gas development, energy production, and nuclear power, and we're the biggest power producer on the country's biggest grid. Our companies are up to the task to meet the many challenges of the 21st century, but meeting those challenges means not fighting climate change with one hand tied behind our back. If the United States is going to succeed, it will do so because it leverages our state's workforce, infrastructure, and human capital in our energy and manufacturing sectors, including nuclear, natural gas, and carbon capture. So we encourage you to work towards durable bipartisan policy that makes it easier to build things again in this country and that leverages our strength. But we have little confidence that federal policy established through executive action or partisan reconciliation wouldn't simply just run roughshod over our state's energy economy. An energy economy that led by prolific production from natural gas and through competitive markets has lowered energy costs by the billions for families and businesses in Pennsylvania and the United States. Air quality has continued to improve dramatically in our state and since 2005, Pennsylvania's reduced CO2 emissions more than any but one other state. As EPA officials recently noted, in large parts because of markets, the nationwide 2030 goals of the Obama administration's Clean Power Plan have already been achieved. And in part due to Pennsylvania's resource base, reducing emissions and sending power prices in the PGM grid down to generational lows, no country has a story to tell like that of the United States when it comes to reducing energy costs and emissions while growing the economy. The U.S. lapped the European Union in growth over the past decade and a half while reducing emissions more. Our energy prices are much lower, and we have an abundance of resources that are lowering our geopolitical risk and that of our allies. 
but we can't take this success for granted. Tax policy that discourages continued investment and growth into our state's energy, commodities, and manufacturing sectors will be a drag on the national economy as a whole. As various reports noted, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act significantly improved the international competitiveness of the United States. In its wake, companies invested in their facilities and workers. In fact, in Pennsylvania, wages went up across all occupations by double digits, with the biggest gains coming from the bottom quartile of workers. This is indicative of the fact that the burden of tax policy is ultimately shouldered by workers, and policymakers should take care that tax policy doesn't further cost us jobs or raise energy costs on families and businesses, not least when in just one year the pandemic and associated response measures cost our states cost our state a decade's worth of job growth. Our industries, particularly those working in energy and infrastructure, need long-term certainty. Such certainty will be certainly eroded if federal officials follow up on generational tax and regulatory reform with even more sweeping mandates and regulations in the other direction in short order. Tax increases on their face are chilling to investment, but so is establishing the precedent that there will be massive changes to tax and regulatory policy following every election cycle. If, in fact, it truly is the case that this desired outcome is a cleaner, more efficient economy, and that's a goal we share, we are not going to reach that goal by pairing the highest corporate rate in the developed world with the slowest, most bureaucratic, most expensive infrastructure build-out regime. Too often, whether it's due to the National Environmental Policy Act or spurious litigation from third parties or states obstructing federally approved infrastructure, it's taking entirely too long to build things in this country. Neither will be well served by tariffs and trade policies that raise costs across the supply chain. In closing, our state's success and pro-growth policies at the federal level have helped the United States keep costs low, produce massive economic growth, become energy independent, and lead the world in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. There's more work to be done, to be sure. So let's come together and produce durable, effective, bipartisan energy and environmental policy that keeps the United States in a flagship position in an increasingly challenging and dynamic global marketplace. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sunday. Now, let me start uh, with you, Ms. Pope. The president committed our country to reducing carbon emissions to more than 50% below 2005 levels by 2030. This is an ambitious target, but in line with what the science says is needed to avert a climate disaster. My take is that the linchpin here is the power sector. To meet the president's goal, America will need to reduce carbon emissions from the power sector by 80% in the next decade. Now, we're obviously digging into how the tax system affects it. And my view is the combination of certainty with flexibility, putting a system in place that provides long-term certainty to businesses while simultaneously providing the flexibility to innovate and to make the best clean energy investments is what we're going to need. In your view, what would be the most helpful tax policies to put that 80% target in reach for you and other utilities? Ms. Pope, you're, you're on mute, on mute. I beg your pardon. You Thank you, Chairman Great. Wyden. Thank you. Uh, let me just start over again. Um, you're absolutely right. To meet these ambitious goals, we are going to need to have the certainty and the flexibility that you're talking about. Certainly, it is going to take us a number of years to get to Portland General Electric's 80% reductions by 2030, and then the more ambitious uh, net zero goals. But we need to make investments in clean and renewable technologies consistently and the well-designed tax incentives like those in your Clean Energy for America Act will give us that long-term certainty and flexibility to accelerate the energy transition and activate all players for that investment. So for us, it's particularly important that we have technology neutral incentives um, and that encourage and reward innovation that really works. Our customer mix and all of our regions across the country's utilities are diverse and the widest set of solutions are needed to meet ever the broadest sets of solutions for the entire country. 
it's critical also that all parties are able to utilize and fully utilize tax credits. So for us to work together on these ambitious goals, we're gonna to need to be able to have a choice between production tax credits and investment tax credits and the normalization alternative for the energy storage investment tax credits. It's especially important utilities that we are able to participate in these credits effectively and level the playing field. Affordability passed directly on to customers is top of mind as we work towards a clean energy future. It's gonna take all of us working together. So thank you. Reducing carbon emissions from the power sector by 80% in the next decade is clearly going to be ambitious, but we're committed to working with you and others to get there because without it, there's a climate catastrophe and we cannot have that. Now let's move to uh, Mr. Walsh and uh, I want to talk about how this argument that if you move to a clean energy economy, somehow you're throwing in the towel on good jobs. And so I'm going to submit for the record now an independent analysis from the Rhodium Group that shows that a clean energy plan like mine would create nearly 600,000 new jobs, more than eight times as many as might be lost in fossil fuels over the next decade. Now, Mr. Walsh, in your testimony, you say that the real issue is ensuring more good paying jobs. And I note that you uh, call for applying federal labor standards to areas like tax incentives, which is similar to what I've proposed. What in your view, because we're talking about the real world, is the impact of these kinds of provisions for workers? And what else should the Congress be looking at to make sure that jobs are high quality and well paid? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think provisions and labor standards like, like the ones you included in, in your technology neutral bill make it much more likely that the, the wages that are paid on these projects building out this infrastructure pay family supporting wages and benefits and give uh, workers a voice on the job. So including standards like prevailing wage and renters registered apprenticeship utilization is key. There are other standards uh, to, to include as well. And, and I would argue domestic content standards as well to make sure that we capture the full manufacturing supply chain benefits of these kind of investments. Now, one other question for you, if I might, uh, Mr. Walsh. We held a hearing on U.S. manufacturing in the committee here recently. It was a hearing on, on incentives for domestic manufacturing, and there was enormous interest among uh, committee members, broad bipartisan interest, and uh, clearly the climate crisis is wreaking havoc through storms and fires and droughts, but it also provides an opportunity for the country to reclaim the mantle of manufacturing and technological leadership through investments in clean energy. We had uh, a leader from the steelworkers, Donnie Blatt, uh, argue at the March hearing that this isn't an abstract issue of global power. It's a real challenge in American communities every single day for American workers. Your organization has been putting a lot of time into this um, issue. What would be the one or two policies, let us say, in the interest of, uh, of brevity that you think are most important to make sure the clean energy revolution is a catalyst for American manufacturing? Thank you for the question. I, 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 in terms of one or two policies, I, 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 would, uh, I would say we need to come at this from, from both the supply and the demand side, right? So uh, on the demand side, ensuring that domestic clean energy products and materials and components uh, are man manufactured in this country by tying clean energy tax credits to domestic content incentives. And then on the supply side, ensuring that domestically manufactured components receive tax credits that directly support the build out and retooling of domestic manufacturing. Um, that there are ways to do that and examples that we have uh, from, from 48C, uh, potentially also an adapted 40, 40, 40F, 45M tax credit and we'd love to explore those with the committee. All right, let's go to uh, Senator Crapo next. Thank you, Chairman Wyden. Uh, first to you, Mr. Brill. A number of companies and organizations have made reduced or zero carbon commitments by 2050 and some by 2030. However, global and national emissions goals will be hard to achieve until the technologies essential to meet them, many of which currently do not exist, are developed and deployed. 
Can you speak to our current energy technology landscape and how energy innovation will play a key role in significant decarbonization? Uh, thank you, Senator Crapo. Um, as we work towards reduce carbon, carbon emissions in the United States, um, both the increased utilization of existing technologies is important. That's the wind and solar that we know today, geothermal and others. But over the longer period of term and the medium term, um, new technologies, some which may exist uh, in a lab or some which may not exist at all, will be increasingly important both here in the United States and globally. This involves both developing those technologies, which are new and innovative ways to, to generate energy without carbon emissions, but also to do that uh, in a cost-effective way, to bring down the costs of those new technologies over time. Um, policies, whether they be R&D focused or the carbon pricing that I suggested, all of these will encourage private sector activity um, in, in the development uh, of, these, of these new technologies, which are necessary both here in, in, and around the world. All right, thank you. And uh, Mr. Sunday, like Pennsylvania, my state of Idaho has a rich history with nuclear energy development and deployment, uh, particularly because of the Idaho National Lab's leadership in nuclear energy R&D. Currently, nuclear energy provides roughly 20% of our electricity and is the largest clean energy source in the United States. Do you think we can meet our clean energy targets without continued investment in R&D and the nuclear power? And can you speak to the benefits that nuclear power provides not only for clean energy production, but also for providing reliable baseload power and grid reliability? Thank you for the question, Senator. And uh, no, I don't think we can meet our goals without nuclear power, and I'm not aware of a credible international um, emissions forecast that doesn't have a role for nuclear moving forward. Um, in terms of the, the benefits, um, According to the National Association of State Energy Officials job report, nuclear pays the highest hourly average wage of all energy resources. And within our state, uh, the PJM grid, but for the maintenance outages every 18 to 24 months, nuclear is going to operate 24 seven, regardless of weather conditions. And they have the benefit of fueling store, uh, storing fuel on site. So uh, very unlikely to ever have a disruption. Uh, it's a fuel source that's safe, it's reliable. Uh, we have a strong vendor and supply chain base in Pennsylvania, and our leading universities like Carnegie Mellon and Penn State are continually producing uh, world-class nuclear engineering graduates that um, are looking for opportunity uh, now and in the future. Well, thank you. I think nuclear energy needs to be one of the key parts of our national energy policy in achieving these laudable goals. Uh, final question back to you, Mr. Brill. It's on the capital gains rate increase that we expect to be proposed by the president in his speech tomorrow night and has already been proposed, frankly. Uh, on, uh, on April 25th, the Wall Street Journal editorial board responded to talk about raising the top tax rate on capital gains to 43.4% with a headline that read, the dumbest tax increase. The most important reason to tax capital investments at low rates is to encourage saving and investment. Consumption, buying a car or a yacht, faces a sales tax, but not a federal tax. But if someone saves income and invests in the family business or stock, he or she is smacked with another round of tax. Taxing something more and you tax something more and you get less of it. Tax capital income more and you get less investment, which means less investment to improve worker productivity and thus smaller income gains over time. My question to you is why is it important to have a low capital gains rate to encourage investment and growth? And what do you think of the trial balloon to raise the top rate on capital gains almost double? Uh, thank you for your question, Senator. The, um, the capital gains tax rate has, has bounced around over time, um, but economists uh, know that um, in terms of long run economic growth, it is important in our country in any in any economy uh, to constantly invest and grow the capital stock. The, the capital gains tax rate works counter to that objective. In particular, raising the capital gains tax rate um, to 40 or 43 percent um, would encourage what's known as lock-in. It would, it would discourage investors from reallocating capital into more productive ways. That's probably counter um, to our objectives to move towards cleaner energy. Um, it's also counter to the objective to, or to achieve capital deepening, a, a larger 
uh, capital base here in the United States, which is good for productivity and, and good for workers' wages. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Crapo. And next, uh, we've got uh, senators uh, with uh, hectic schedules will be Senator Stabenow. And Senator Stabenow has been uh, the leader of the green manufacturing effort with Senator Manchin and Senator Gaines. Uh, why don't you go ahead, Senator Stabenow? Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I first just want to thank you for this really important hearing. And I'm proud to be uh, a co-sponsor of your Clean Energy for America Act, which I think is so significant. And before asking a question, I know, Mr. Chairman, you've heard me say this before, but whenever we talk about winners and losers, I just have to go back to 1914 when Henry Ford and Thomas Edison in Michigan first started out making an automobile and tried to have it battery operated. And it was so difficult, all the challenges on range and a whole range of things. And two years later, Congress decided to put its full weight on tax policy behind oil and gas in 1916 and basically give robust uh, uh, tax credits that ended up essentially in uh, no interest loans. And 100 years later, uh, they're still winning. So we, we did actually, in our tax policy, pick winners and losers. And I really appreciate that you're just simply trying to level the playing field. And maybe we'll get back to where Henry Ford and Thomas Edison actually envisioned over 100 years ago. Um, there's, there's no question that when you think about the climate crisis, we have unprecedented challenges. But what is exciting uh, is the fact that we have great economic opportunities as well. And that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, we have some catching up to do on clean energy manufacturing. Manufacturing, we know, as your other hearings have showed. I mean, today China holds 75% of the world's manufacturing capacity for lithium ion battery cells and builds over 70% of the solar panels. And the current semiconductor shortage shines a light on the threats that supply chain vulnerabilities pose to US global competitiveness. Uh, but uh, we know we can change that, and that's what this is really all about. So, uh, Mr. Walsh, uh, thank you for the Blue Green Alliance has worked for so many years. I remember when you first got it started, and I've been a, a strong supporter the entire time. Thank you for endorsing the American Jobs and Energy Manufacturing Act, which, as you indicated, is a bipartisan uh, initiative with Senator Manchin and Senator Daines. And, uh, we really believe that the 48C program can once again drive investments in clean energy manufacturing. And I also, and, and before asking you to respond, Mr. Wash, um, I think it's important to know, and I'm really pleased to be working with our chairman on a production tax credit for domestic production of batteries, semiconductors, solar cells. I wondered if you could speak to why we need to be providing incentives, not only investments in new and retooling manufacturing plants, which I think is critical, but also a tax incentive for each unit produced. And what would it be the implications of providing an investment tax credit only, but not a production tax credit for manufacturing? Thank you for the question, uh, Senator Stabenow, and, and thank you very much for, for sponsoring the American Jobs and Energy Manufacturing Act. We're, we're proud to endorse it. As you know, that, that is a 30% investment tax credit, um, which was created to re-equip, expand, and uh, establish domestic clean energy, transportation, grid technology, uh, manufacturing facilities. We particularly appreciate the way in which you provide incentives in that legislation to site facilities uh, in, in communities that have uh, suffered coal economy job loss and deindustrialization. We think that's a, a critical equity consideration. Um, 48C is, is incredibly important. It, it, it has historically been successful in generating investments in new facilities and equipment. Uh, it has been less successful in generating large scale investments and, and, and the durable incentives necessary to grow domestic manufacturing supply chains over the long term, right? So uh, production tax credits like 45M can fill this gap and provide enough security uh, in terms of demand for investors to create the kind of large-scale facilities 
that are not only necessary to meet our climate ambitions, but to keep us globally competitive. Um, as you know, these are big capital expenditures. Uh, investors are gonna, gonna need that certainty and are gonna need some assistance. And we view uh, an investment tax credit and a production tax credit uh, as complementary to achieving those goals. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I know we have a number of members that are all balancing schedules, so I will not ask another question, but I am uh, I have many questions. I appreciate the panel and uh, including the the 30D consumer tax incentives that are so important on the, the front end on electric vehicles and look forward to working with you and with everyone as we move uh, what I think is a very exciting economic opportunity forward. That's a win-win on uh, how we address the climate crisis and also create jobs. So thank you. Thank you, Senator, Senator Stabenow. And uh, we look forward to working with you on greening up manufacturing and getting that win-win. Our next uh, 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 panel member to ask questions will be Senator Carper, who's also the chairman of Environment and Public Works. He's got his hands full. We appreciate him. Now, Mr. Chairman, thanks so much. This is a terrific hearing with uh, terrific uh, witnesses, and we're grateful to both you and the ranking member. Uh, the ranking uh, member raised the issue of nuclear. My wife and I usually come home uh, after church on Sunday mornings, and the first thing we do is go to the kitchen and fix breakfast. And we have breakfast with a guy named uh, Farif, Farif Zakaria. And this last uh, Sunday, he spent the last four minutes of his show talking about nuclear, just advice, providing it's, advice, it's, unsolicited it's advice. For people that, that How it, not it, to lose the mouse? I frequently. <laughs> Debbie, you need to mute. <laughs> Anyway, he provided some friendly advice to President Biden that he would not dismiss and lose sight of the, uh, of the uh, what uh, nuclear is already doing in terms of providing uh, carbon-free electricity and the future that it uh, might provide with uh, with advanced technology. So I just leave that with uh, my colleagues. I, I'm going to send around a copy of his uh, four-minute close on the show to to our colleagues. And just ask for uh, to take a look at it if you if you will. Uh, I uh, I would thank all of our witnesses for for joining us today. It's, could not be uh, more interesting, more important, more timely. And last week, our president celebrated Earth Day by, by committing uh, the United States to becoming 50% cleaner in terms of greenhouse gas emissions by the end of the decade. Uh, through my work uh, on this uh, committee and as chairman of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, I remain committed to passing laws that will drive down dangerous emissions and, and uh, clean energy costs for consumers, uh, help uh, the climate, uh, help tackle the climate crisis head on and support economic growth in this uh, country. To date, uh, clean uh, energy investment and production tax credits have been indispensable tools in driving clean energy and economic growth in our country. But to meet our amb ambitious uh, climate goals, we can do better. Indeed, we must do better. And that's why I was delighted to join our chairman again in introducing the Clean Energy for America Act. And I was particularly pleased that this year's legislation draws on a number of common sense policies that some of our colleagues and I have co-authored this year. The Save America's uh, Clean Energy Jobs Act, uh, which I introduced with Senator Whitehouse and Senator Heinrich, provide temporary refundability for uh, clean energy credits. The clean energy developers are currently unable to access uh, tax equity uh, financing as a result of the pandemic, leaving clean energy projects frozen and unable to break ground. Refundability of these credits will provide efficient access to capital that will immediately help facilitate job creation to, in the clean energy sector, all while contributing to more reliable power, cleaner air, and a true win-win-win situation. Question. Ms. Pope, could you share with us, please, your thoughts on how refundability of these credits could lead to increased clean air innovation, clean energy innovation, and capital deployment, as well as to more good-paying jobs? Ms. Pope, please. Senator, thank you. Uh, and thank you for your question and your leadership on this issue, as well as your leadership uh, on the nuclear issue. Uh, your legislation recognizes near term challenges that many projects face in terms of a direct pay option. The short term nature um, is helpful, but uh, longer term, it would be more helpful if there was more certainty. Direct pay lowers the project costs. Um, and our savings that can be directly paid on to customers. And as you know, their transition and the work we have to do is very significant. So keeping customer prices low is very important, but it also frees up capital to invest in additional clean energy projects. These investments, this has been noted, will result in additional jobs. Um, and to direct pay's impact on innovation, lowered project costs when combined with technology neutral credits 
gives us the ability to innovate and choose technologies that best maintain a reliable and affordable energy grid. Given the investments uh, that are needed in the next decade in order to reach aggressive greenhouse gas emissions, reduction goals that the President, Congress, and we at PGE share as many as well as other utilities across the country, it's going to need even longer term direct pay options such as that proposed by Chairman Wyden. But thank you so much for, for your support of the direct pay option. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. Pope. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I'm probably close to out of town. I'd just like to ask one last question for the record, if I could. And Mr. Brill, Mr. Brill uh, laid out a thoughtful in, uh, endorsement of implementing a uh, technology neutral carbon tax to address global warming. Um, and I would, I'm gonna ask for the record, the reaction of our witnesses to what he had to say. Is this a, a fool's errand? Uh, is this something that we ought to get serious about? Uh, and if you could just uh, respond to that for, for the record. I think I have one more minute. If I can, I'll, I'll ask a, a quick a quick question. This is a question of Mr. Walsh, please. And it deals with 30C tax credit for vehicle charging and refueling stations. And uh, uh, I, uh, uh, the transportation sector generates about 29% of our carbon emissions, the highest source of carbon emissions in our, our country, global emissions. To clean up our transportation sector, we need cleaner uh, vehicles powered by sources other than oil, and we can't have clean vehicles without clean vehicle fueling infrastructure. We gotta have both. That's why I recently introduced the Securing America's Clean Fuels Infrastructure Act. Senator Richard Burr, our colleague on this uh, uh, panel, along with uh, our, our colleagues, uh, Senator uh, Cortez Masto and uh, Senator Stabenow. This legislation will improve and expand the 30C tax uh, incentive for investments in clean vehicle infrastructure like uh, electric vehicle charging stations and hydrogen fueling stations. And this leg legislation is legislation is complementary to broader efforts uh, in the uh, EPW committee, which I uh, chair to decarbonize our uh, transportation sector. So, and this infrastructure is necessary for the success of our American automakers and for the widespread adoption of cleaner vehicles. And that's why the major automakers along with the fuel cell and electric vehicle infrastructure support the legislation a question for the record for mr walsh mr walsh can you speak for us on, on the record uh to the importance of tax policy that support the deployment of clean vehicles and clean vehicle infrastructure thank you all for coming today and uh, responding to our questions and your willingness to respond to a few more for the record thank you so much thank, thank you senator carper senator grassley uh, thank you mr chairman uh, green energy, of course, is music to my ears. I'm the father of the wind energy tax credit, and 30 years uh, have proven to be a very successful initiative. Now, on a different note, leading to a question for Mr. Brill, I often hear my Democrat colleagues complain about companies paying zero taxes. However, oftentimes, the reason a profitable company pays no tax is they are eligible for tax incentives, such as green energy incentives. Recently, there have been proposals from both sides of the aisle to make incentives in green energy uh, essentially refundable uh, by providing a direct pay option. This option is included in the chairman's technology neutral uh, proposal. I don't necessarily object to direct pay. It might make sense in certain circumstances. But in light of my colleagues' concern about companies paying zero tax, my question for Mr. Brill is, couldn't a direct pay option result in companies having a negative tax liability, that is receiving a tax refund in excess of taxes paid? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, the answer is uh, certainly yes. Uh, the direct pay option um, is only useful or effective in the cases where, where there is no other tax liability. So it by definition would increase the number of firms paying no or in fact negative tax rates these these two issues are just as you're suggesting certainly in conflict to be concerned about businesses in particular years not paying federal income tax and then at the same time um, promoting uh, policies that would exacerbate that reality the truth is that it is quite normal and natural in many instances for firms uh, not to pay uh, uh, corporate income tax, even if they're showing book income, that's a result of a sound corporate income tax system involving that operating loss to carry forward and carry back, um, and is not necessarily uh, something that policymakers should be concerned with. Proposals to create uh, minimum taxes of, of for certain businesses uh, that don't pay um, tax when they're booked when they report income um, is, in effect, 
bringing back uh, the alternative minimum tax in another form, uh, something that's not good, I think, for the U.S. economy. Okay. Uh, you're getting into my next question, Mr. Brill, so stay there. Uh, due to concerns of company reducing their tax liability to zero, President Biden has proposed a new 15% corporate minimum tax based on book income. Of course, book income generally doesn't reflect tax incentives. So, Mr. Brill, for some companies, wouldn't a book tax effectively remove the benefit of green energy incentives, thus undermining the legislative intent of those provisions? It very well could, Senator. You're correct. Um, the minimum tax that President Biden has proposed, um, if fully implemented as, as it's being described, would negate uh, many of these provisions um, that are also being um, advocated and proposed, and so they work at, at cross purposes for sure. Next question will be for Mr. Walsh. President Biden's infrastructure program calls for over 174 billion in consumer rebates for electric vehicles. However, the Energy Information Administration projects that in 2050, 81 uh, percent of the new vehicle sales will be still be gas powered or flex fuel. Biofuels are the only option to make significant immediate carbon reductions from the cars that are on the roads today. So, Mr. Walsh, would you agree that the investment should also be made in biofuels infrastructure to maximize carbon reductions in the near future? Thank you for the question, uh, Senator Grassley. Uh, as a coalition of a bunch of different partners, uh, we, we have typically not taken positions on, on biofuels, but let me... Uh, let, let me talk to some of our partners and get back to you on that one. Well, thank you very much. And then also for you, Mr. Walsh, and this will have to be my last question. The United States only comprises one sixth of all global uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the international demand for energy is rapidly growing. Uh, as you mentioned in your testimony, the United States has a significant number of manufacturing facilities specializing in wind energy. One of those is my state of Iowa. How can the United States support more exports of our clean energy production and other technologies to meet global demand for the uh, for alternative energy? Uh, we can we can support uh, the, the wind in the end industry and, and other clean technology industries with, with a range of uh, both tax policies and direct investment. Uh, and doing so, we would argue for, for the points you make, uh, make them uh, uh, competitive to capture market share in what will be one of the most important global economic races of this century. So, so we'd be strongly supportive of that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Grassley, Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for this important hearing. It's uh, ironic that over in the Energy Committee, we're having a discussion about carbon production on public lands. And I think there is an important nexus here. I know one of the speakers was saying about how this is the Committee of Jurisdiction on Important Incentives. But over there, we're not really charging the right royalty response to the impacts of carbon pollution on public lands. If we did and took into consideration their true impact, we would generate billions of royalties. So uh, maybe Mr. Uh, Walsh would have a second to uh, uh, respond to that. But generally, um, I'm here to continue to talk about uh, the price on carb, you know, fix, making sure that we move forward. The uh, Senator Hatch and I in 2007 did the first tax incentive, $7,500 for electric vehicles. So just think about that. That was 2007. And now look at where we are today with the plethora of a marketplace of many electric vehicles and some states, even like mine, moving forward on trying to create all electric markets by a certain time period. So one of the issues I think that we have to address is there's about 5% of our vehicles, but they represent 23% of the emissions and that's heavy duty trucks. So thank you, uh, Senator Wyden for your legislation, but I want to hear whether the um, either uh, Mr. Brill or others support a 30% uh, ITC on heavy duty trucks uh, investment tax credit so that we can get that aspect, which is again, disproportional to the amount. There might be 5% of the vehicles, they're 23% of the emissions. So can we, and should we tackle that next? And obviously would like to hear people's views on uh, 
why setting a price on carbon? Senator Collins and I had a cap and dividend bill. So we were trying to send the right market signals and give time for the market to adjust. So I see now where chambers of commerce and people like AEI and others are saying, yes, that is right. We need we need this price signal. So I'm not talking about, I'm, I'm asking uh, the AEI witness to comment about why predictability is so important. But first, Mr. Walsh, if you wanted to comment on public lands and why a 30% ITC on heavy duty trucks are important. Um, I, thank you for the, the questions, Senator. I mean, we are, uh, I think, supportive of getting a fair return for taxpayers uh, in terms of royalties uh, from extraction on public lands. Happy to follow up with you on that uh, to get into a little bit more detail on, on trucks. Um, we'd have to look at the specifics uh, of an investment tax credit on, on trucks, but, but conceptually, that's going to be incredibly important. Uh, we, we, we are already on, I think, a clear pathway with passenger cars, have some more work to do to, 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 to get there with, with trucks, and so would welcome an opportunity to talk with you and your staff about that. Well, I think the technology. I think the technology is there, and, and just like with everything, uh, non-refundable engineering costs uh, are costly things that drive or prohibit the market. And what we found with the tax credit for automobiles is that it really accelerated in just a short period of time. Look at where we are, and that's the whole point. I think that's what we do best, frankly. I think we incent things that. Uh, take some of those costs off the table to make the manufacturing market go faster than it might normally would. Otherwise, the cost of the cars are prohibitive. They can't get the market running or up and running, I should say. So anyway, Mr. Brill, on the larger question about AEI and Chambers of Commerce looking for a focused approach, why that's better and predictable. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, uh, as I mentioned in my written testimony, um, uh, numerous economists across the political spectrum have for a long time um, advocated for a price on carbon. And as you noted, more recently, uh, the business community, BRT, the Chamber of Commerce, API, and others have also uh, joined in, in, that, in that view. Uh, a price on carbon is a very broad-based strategy for addressing climate emissions, as opposed to the narrow approach um, of, of a specific uh, subsidy or, tar or targeted tax credit. Um, for that reason, it works through a myriad of channels. It encourages both the innovation of new technologies, as well as encouraging consumers to alter their behavior um, uh, to reduce energy con uh, consumption overall as well as encouraging the deployment of existing technologies. And it's my view, and I think the view of many uh, who say this from an academic perspective, as well as now from a business perspective, that this broad-based approach um, is a durable policy and one that could, could lead to the increase in deployment of the, of the technologies we know, as well as the development of the technologies that we, that we can't even yet imagine. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I just would be remiss if I didn't reiterate my interest in, look, I think we work across global markets on these issues. I think we engage other countries, big markets that are big CO2 polluters and get them to uh, join us on pledges to uh, drive down price on uh, product that's going to help us. Uh, you know, deal with uh, carbon emissions. I think the more we create that global market, the better we create the the opportunities for our U.S. products as well. So anyway, thank you for the important hearing and certainly support your legislation that was just recently introduced as a broad way to incent uh, electric generation of uh, more carbon free uh, energy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, uh the fact that in 2007, once again, you were ahead of the times with Senator Hatch and uh, electric vehicles. And so we appreciate all the leadership. Next, Senator Menendez. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, a newly released study by the largest reinsurance company in the world uh, found that climate change would cost the global economy 18% of GDP by 2050, including 10% of US GDP. Uh, while some have said that transitioning to renewable energy is too expensive or that it kills jobs, with every passing day and every passing disaster, it becomes more and more clear that the cost of inaction is far higher than the cost of creating a modern, sustainable, clean energy economy. 
So, Mr. Walsh, will a transition to a clean energy economy coupled with strong coordination with our global partners to combat climate change be beneficial for our economy and our nation in the long run? Thank you for the question, Senator. I think it would. And, and actually, the, the first analysis I would point to is, is one by the Rhodium Group that Senator Wyden uh, entered into the record uh, at the start of this hearing, which shows net uh, job creation of uh, roughly 600,000 jobs annually over a 10-year period. That's only looking at decarbonizing the electricity sector. Obviously, we have to do this economy-wide. You know, bottom line, we're going to have to manufacture and install and operate and maintain an enormous amount of new generation capacity, uh, along with transmission lines uh, and uh, energy storage to make that possible. And, and that will create an enormous number of jobs. I think the bigger challenges will be, one, ensuring that these jobs are high quality and uh, accessible and across the full value chain, including manufacturing. Uh, two, targeting investment uh, and the jobs it creates to parts of the country where that investment in job creation has lagged to date. And three, which is very much related to two, uh, ensuring that, that workers and communities that have relied on fossil energy sources are not left behind. Absolutely. So we use our tax code to incentivize private sector investment in areas that fit the public good. And I think we've we've established that acting on climate is an economic imperative and that our continued reliance on fossil fuels not only harms public health and our environment, but also our economy. And that clean energy technologies have the potential to create millions of good paying jobs right here at home. Yet the United States continues to subsidize the fossil fuel industry to the tune of billions of dollars every year. Instead of moving us in the right direction, my Republican colleagues used the 2017 tax bill to give even more handouts to big oil. I have previously introduced the Close the Big Oil Tax Loopholes Act to try to correct some of these taxpayer subsidies to corporate polluters, and I'm uh, working towards reintroducing that legislation. I know the chairman uh, has worked to incorporate some of these principles into his Clean Energy for America Act as well, which I support. Uh, and I hope we can work together to move the uh, parts of the tax code uh, in uh, the right direction. And speaking of the right direction, um, last year, pse and the parent company uh, for New Jersey's largest electric uh, electricity utility, announced that it was divesting its fossil fuel assets. At the same time, they maintain a 25% stake in the ocean wind project in federal waters off of our state. Uh, Ms. Pope, as companies like yours face decisions on decarbonization going forward, in order to ensure a smooth transition, how vital is it that the tax code catches up to current market trends? Thank you, Senator. Uh, it's definitely time to update the tax code to match current demands with new technologies, flexibility, and long-term certainty. The technology-neutral approach does this, and it does not pick winners and losers or lock in specific technologies, but is a good way to encourage innovation and incent clean energy deployment. Your example in PSEG's offshore wind um, is a great example, um, and certainly that long-term tax policy is critical to utilities who routinely engage in long-term planning, uh, and invest in long-lived assets, 20 to 40 years or more. Tax incentives also help keep customer prices affordable, especially when designed to ensure that the full credits reach customers. Tax policy needs to be paired with continued federal funding for research, development, and deployment of emerging technologies, including the offshore wind that you were talking about, but also renewable hydrogen, long-term storage, and smart grid advances. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Uh, Senator uh, Thune is next. next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, and um, thank you to all the witnesses for your testimony. Um, on President Biden's first day in office, he issued an executive action canceling the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. The decision led to the loss of good paying jobs in South Dakota and across the country and set the nation back in terms of modernizing our energy infrastructure. 
Even the Canadian Prime Minister, a member of the Liberal Party, supported the pipeline and included it in Canada's clean energy roadmap. The pipeline's operator committed to operate Keystone with net zero emissions by 2030 and pledged to invest $1.7 billion on solar, wind, and battery power to operate the pipeline. This would have ranked the operator among the highest corporate backers of renewable energy purchases uh, directly supporting the green energy agenda. Since the executive action, the president has proposed trillions of new taxpayer dollars to address infrastructure and the climate, but the $9 billion pipeline project would have helped benefit both of those areas and added thousands of American jobs. Mr. Sunday, if our nation wants to maintain its place as an economic superpower, will we need to modernize both conventional energy infrastructure and the buildup of low emissions energy projects? Thank you for the question, Thank Senator. You for the question, Senator. Yes, absolutely. Yes, As a recent report from Columbia University said, while it's counterintuitive, the most efficient and cost-effective way to reach climate goals is going to be to continue to invest in our uh, gas infrastructure. And along with that, I would encourage continued uh, reforms and streamlining and certainty on siting interstate uh, energy projects like the one that you referenced. Next, chill other large-scale private investments that are both good for American energy security and for the environment. I apologize, Senator. I apologize, Senator. You were on mute the first half of that question. I'm off mute. So just tell me how does preventing such projects as Keystone chill other large scale private investments that are both good for American energy security and the environment? Thank you. Yes. Uh, in the infrastructure space, you're looking at multi decade timelines for um, certainty and making estimations on if the investment makes sense. If we enter this framework, the only period of time you know that you might have certainty over the next is the next couple of years. Uh, capital is not going to be interested in investing in the types of projects that we were absolutely going to need uh, to meet energy demand now and into the future move being a net importer of most forms of energy to a declining importer and as of 2019 a net exporter of energy uh, truly remarkable transformation u.s <coughs> excuse me oil production and natural gas production hit record highs in 2019 and today our country is the largest producer of natural gas in the world much of this progress of course has come from american innovation in extractions from unconventional formations such as shale and a policy and regulatory environment that encourages growth. Uh, Mr. Brill, how would raising the corporate tax rate by a third and eliminating all fossil fuel tax incentives impact America's energy security? And would such policies increase the cost of energy consumption for Americans? Uh, thank you, Senator uh, Thune. Raising the corporate tax rate um, as has been proposed by President Biden um, from 21% to 28%, or even from 21% to 25%, um, raises the cost of capital, raises the cost of new investments uh, for all corporations, including energy corporations, including clean energy corporations, businesses trying to develop new clean energy, as well as existing businesses working um, in the natural gas space, which is a relatively low carbon technology, um, and, and other industries as well. This uh, has a myriad of adverse consequences. This is bad for our, for our US economy from an international competitiveness perspective, but it's bad from an energy perspective uh, with respect to those businesses that are trying to make investments uh, here in the United States. And so this policy works at cross purpose to the overall objective of, I think of this hearing, and I think of the, the right for objective of, of energy security and, and clean energy in the United States. As anybody on the panel can respond to this, but one concern I have about the proposed carbon fees or other emission based proposals is that we first have to have an accurate account of emissions. Uh, South Dakota is a leader in clean energy in terms of wind, hydroelectric and biofuels, yet we face obstacles like the EPA using outdated greenhouse gas modeling for ethanol, which cuts fuels emission, fuel emissions, I should say, by roughly half. Biodiesel cuts emissions by 70% and advanced biofuels when paired with CO2 storage could approach carbon negative territory. How do we ensure accurately are we are that we are accurately counting for the real emission of all sources to ensure that we have a level playing field when it comes to these incentives? Anybody? And I know, yeah, I know I'm out of time. So whoever wants to take that one.
Senator Thune, could we take that one for the record? For the record? Nobody wants to answer it, evidently. So, yeah, that's fine, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank my I colleague thank my for his reality. Senator Portman. Appreciate your sending uh, us all in. Here I am. Uh, first of all, I, I appreciate the witnesses. Some of you talked about permitting today, and one of the things that concerns me is that it takes so long to permit a project, and it's so darn expensive. Uh, in your testimony, Mr. Sunday, you talked about that and the need for reform. Uh, back a few years ago, former Senator Claire McCaskill and I offered legislation called the Federal Permitting Improvements During Council, called FAST 41, because it's in the FAST uh, Highway Bill, and the uh, AFL, AFL CIO, Building Trades Council, as well as a lot of business groups supported it, and it's worked. Uh, it saved large infrastructure projects well over a billion dollars. By the way, much of these projects are clean energy projects, including hydro on rivers in Ohio. And uh, so my, my question for you is, uh, should we be doing more of that? My concern is that it sunsets, this bill uh, sunsets the council in 2022. Um, are you aware of this FAST 41 proposal uh, 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 project, uh, Mr. Sunday, and would you support lifting the sunset so it can continue? Thank you, Senator. Uh, absolutely. We appreciate uh, your leadership on this issue. The business community uh, is behind it, and we would certainly um, support its extension. Uh, we've seen FAST 41 permitting help get some very important Pennsylvania energy infrastructure projects built more efficiently, uh, including uh, a uh, pipeline that's helping gas get exported to developing worlds to help them meet their energy needs and reduce uh, security risk. Um, the FAST Act that you mentioned has reduced statute of limitations and in time for environmental reviews and has helped put uh, capital in the ground and put people to work in this country. So we appreciate your leadership on this issue. Great. Well, I would hope that no matter what we do, uh, that we extend uh, FAST 41 and ensure that we can have the federal dollar uh, stretch further by reducing the costs and the time and, and permitting. Uh, Ohio is one of these energy states like Pennsylvania, uh, Mr. Sunday, where we've got a lot of manufacturing. We've also got uh, a lot of coal and natural gas. Um, we have nuclear, we have renewables, we have solar, wind, hydro. Um, the fossil fuels though, the natural gas in particular, we're gonna need to continue in our energy mix for some time as a reliable and affordable baseload energy source. Uh, because of this, I think carbon capture is absolutely critical and you know for our nation to reduce emissions along the lines that are being talked about absolutely essential uh, without undercutting our economy carbon capture uh, and direct air capture facilities are costly it's very expensive and uh, up to a billion dollars as an example at a power plant and i think there's an opportunity for us to use the tax code more here we have 45q which is a tax credit which we just extended for additional two years um, in our 2020 year-end spending bill that's an important incentive I continue to work with Senator Bennett, who's on the committee on carbon capture improvement through our Carbon Capture Improvement Act, which allows the use of private activity bonds. And I like private activity bonds in part because it's an incentive for private investment as well, um, while creating efficiencies for the government. Mr. Brill, are you aware of our uh, carbon capture uh, legislation that uses private activity bonds? By the way, as was used in the 70s for scrubbers. And uh, how do you feel about that? And Mr. Sunday, since Pennsylvania shares many of the similarities to Ohio, can you can you comment on that as well? Uh, thank you, Senator Portman. Uh, broadly speaking, from a technology perspective, carbon capture, I think, is critically important going forward because we're going to continue to have um, uh, forms of energy uh, that are that do contain some some form some carbon emissions, such as natural gas. And so the ability to capture that is a critical way to get uh, to lower emissions overall and eventually perhaps to, to net zero. Um, so carbon capture is critically important and as you noted uh, is expensive um, r d in this area to help uh, bring down those costs um, will be important in the development of a price on carbon it'll be important to to make adjustments for for carbon emissions which are captured and of course as you as you noted um, other uh, strategies such as private activity bonds uh, 45q um, or reform to those provisions may also encourage uh, the deployment of carbon capture yeah, Mr. Sunday, comments? Uh, thank you, Senator. Yes, and when I mentioned my opening statement, no state but one that reduced emissions more than Pennsylvania, Ohio was number one. So I know we compete on a lot of fronts, um, but this is certainly one area where our state should work together given uh, shared energy interests, uh, the shared pipeline infrastructure, similar geologies. Um, we have some, some projects uh, in the beginning stage on carbon capture 
And it certainly makes sense to continue to pursue that um, as there's no uh, real reasonable scenario that we meet uh, net zero by 2050 without continued investment into carbon capture. Well, we think this uh, productivity bonds is, is an effective way to finance it. We also finance direct air capture facilities in our new version of the legislation. So we look forward to working Mr. Chairman with the committee on that. And thank you for having to ask questions. Thank you, uh, Senator Portman. Let me also just say to colleagues under the Clean Energy for America Act, a gas or coal plant that fully captures its emissions would qualify for the same amount as a wind or solar farm, because this bill is all about reducing emissions. So I appreciate uh, uh, my colleagues' uh, questions on this. Senator Toomey, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, the uh, 2017 tax reform was guided by an underlying theory in terms of the design on the business side of that. The idea was if we lower the after-tax cost of investing capital, we'll have an increase in invested capital. And it is invested capital that makes workers more productive. And we said that if we do this, we're likely to get that investment and the result will be more income for workers as well as an accelerating, accelerated growth in our economy. Um, this is exactly what happened. Uh, Mr. Sunday, as you mentioned in your testimony in the wake of the TCJA, Pennsylvania companies in particular invested in their facilities and their workers. From 2016 to 2020, Pennsylvania alone added over 238,000 jobs. Medium wages grew by 13.5%. In some sectors, like the chemical plant operators and natural gas power plant operators, wage growth was 34% and 20% respectively. Fact is, by January 2020, in the wake of our tax reform, we had the strongest economy of my lifetime. We had, were at full employment. We had more job openings than people looking for jobs. The poverty rate was at a record low. African-American unemployment, all-time record low. Wages were growing for everyone, but they were growing fastest for the lowest income workers. So we were narrowing the income gap as well. And now, shockingly, what the Biden administration and many of my Democratic colleagues want to do is reverse the policies that got us there unwind the tax reform that gave us the best economy of my entire lifetime. So, Mr. Sunday, could you comment on how you think Pennsylvania business and workers would be affected if the Biden tax increases went into effect? Thank you for the question, Senator, and thank you for your leadership on tax reform and all the work you've done on behalf of our state um, over these many years. Um, we can't lose sight of the fact that Pennsylvania has the second highest flat CNI in the country. We have unfair treatment of NOLs. You layer all that on top of raising the federal rate and keeping in base in place all the base partners that were part of TCJA. And suddenly, not only does America have uh, the highest corporate rate in the country, Pennsylvania is is ten points higher than that, and we become a very uncompetitive place to do business. Uh, we just saw that we're losing a congressional seat. I don't think that uh, unfair, unattractive tax and regulatory policy is going to uh, uh, do anything to reverse that type of population and, and investment loss. Yeah, I would just um, strongly stress it would be OK to get back to the best economy of my lifetime. That would be a good thing to aspire to. Maybe keeping in place the policies that got us there would be a good idea. Speaking of which, um, in your testimony, and just uh, a moment ago with Senator Portman, there was a discussion about CO2 emissions. Uh, my, uh, according to the data I've seen, the U.S. as a whole had brought its CO2 emissions down. We've been doing that steadily. Um, and by 2019, our CO2 emissions were back to the level they were at in 1992, in absolute amounts. And on a per capita basis, we had brought the CO2 emission level down to the level of 1950. Now, we all know what did that. It was natural gas replacing coal as a source of electricity. And Pennsylvania has led the way together with Ohio. We're the two top states in CO2 emission reductions. Pennsylvania is an energy powerhouse. Um, could you give us some sense of your view on how central a role natural gas has played in the Pennsylvania economy, but also in America achieving this remarkable success 
in reducing the level of CO2 emissions at a rate faster than most people thought even possible. Sure. Yeah, over the last decade, we've seen an 11-fold increase in natural gas production in Pennsylvania, and that's brought utility bills down by the billions in aggregate electricity prices in PGM are at generational lows. Uh, we're, that's more money that folks have to save and invest and meet their budgets, uh, low-income folks in particular who are spending 10 to 15 to 20 percent of their budget on utility bills, a lot of breathing room there. We're seeing manufacturers in our state invest in combined heat and power projects to reduce costs, uh, enhance output, add shifts. Uh, go, one consumer uh, packaged good plant in the Northeast went from one of the most expensive plants in that company's uh, footprint to being a net revenue raiser on energy because they can now sell power back to the grid. It's been a total game changer for our energy and uh, for our economy and the environment. And, and I'll close with this, Mr. Chairman, and uh, all the while this has been happening uh, since 2010, from 2010 to last year, Pennsylvania's power sector emissions have declined by 36%. It's really a remarkable story of the success of natural gas. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Toomey. Senator Cardin. Well, Mr. Chairman, first, uh, I want to thank you for your leadership on the legislation that you've introduced. Uh, we do need a level playing field. We do need predictability. We do need a rational basis for how we provide in the tax code for our energy sources. And I think you've given us a template. And I just really wanna first thank you for your, your leadership on this issue. Uh, I, I do wanna acknowledge uh, several of the witnesses. Uh, their comments have been what I agree with. Uh, as Pope said, we need a level playing field. And I couldn't agree more that we do need a level playing field on energy. And Mr. Brill, I, I appreciate your comments in regards to a, a carbon tax. I do think that's the clearest, easiest way that we can reward uh, clean uh, energy. So I think that is, uh, and we energize the, the private sector to do what's right. So I think that's e extremely important. And then Senator Crapo asked a question to Mr. Sunday in regards to nuclear power, which I agree with. I'm a Democrat, he's a Republican. We need nuclear power, it's 20% of our electricity today. It is a carbon-free, basically, source of, of, of energy. So. Until we can get to that level playing field, nuclear power is at a disadvantage in that uh, it does not have a production tax credit or investment tax credit. Uh, it, the cost of uh, power today is, it makes it very difficult to modernize our nuclear power plants without some form of a tax credit. So we are looking at a, pro a production tax credit in this Congress uh, as, a, as a way of leveling a playing field on nuclear power. So I wanted to give Ms. Pope and Ms perhaps Mr. Bill, an opportunity to respond as to, on at least uh, the current basis, what we need to do to encourage the modernization of our nuclear power plants. Um, thank you, Senator. Um, additional tax policy that enables the continuation of the country's nuclear plants is critically important uh, if we're going to achieve the 2030 and 2035 goals. Existing nuclear is an important carbon free resource and today, as you noted, makes up 20% of the country's energy supply and clearly that much higher percentage of the clean energy supply for the country. But new nuclear is going to take investments. It's going to take investments that have certainty uh, because we know the complexity. Uh, it's going to take uh, investments when partnering with Idaho National Labs and other labs as part of DOE. It's going to take uh, credits and the discussion we've had today with regards to tech neutral um, and um, incentives that allow for all participants to be able to participate equally. So that is allowing people to be able to use investment tax credits, production tax credits, and most importantly, um, the uh, take making sure that everyone is able to access um, the, and we have a normalization fix uh, for all participants, particularly utilities, most of whom operate many of the util, uh, the nuclear plants in the country. Thank you, Mr. Brill, you wanna add? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Senator Cardin. Um, I would note, I would agree uh, with you and others who have talked about the importance of nuclear power um, as a consistent and reliable source of energy in the United States. Um, consistent with my testimony and a price on carbon. A price on carbon uh, would it likely extend the life of the existing uh, fleet or stock of nuclear power in the United States. To get to new investments in nuclear power, that will involve uh, new technologies, new research, um, uh, and, and new uh, and, and regulatory changes that will facilitate and bring down the cost of those new investments as well. 
Thank you. I want to mention one other area, and that's conservation. Conservation, conserving energy is a win-win-win for everyone. And our tax code needs to be sensitive on how it, we can use that to encourage conservation. Uh, we were able to get Section 179D, which allows for the uh, energy efficiencies of our buildings uh, to be made permanent. But there are still areas that we could vastly improve the tax code as it relates to the conservation of energy in our buildings under Section 179D. Uh, there are other sections of the tax code that can encourage conservation and reduce the amount of energy we use, which would be friendly towards our uh, climate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So I just really want to put on the table that one of the areas that I think is low hanging fruit is for us to in improve the provisions we have in our tax code as it relates to conserving the use of energy. We can do that in the auto industry, you know that with electric vehicles, or, uh, we, we can do that in so many different areas. And I, I applaud the chairman for his leadership in this area and for the other members of our committee as we work together to develop an energy policy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cardin. You're the first to explicitly mention conservation and we appreciate it. Our next two senators will be Senator Cassidy and Senator Brown and colleagues. We're gonna to try to keep this moving even though we have uh, a vote. Senator Cassidy. Hey, Mr. Sunday, thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here. Mr. Sunday, I'm always struck when people talk about things like intangible drilling costs as being some big bailout for a super major. Uh, but as you and I both know, they don't qualify for the intangible drilling cost deduction. Is that correct? That's my understanding. It's more limited to the independents. And specifically only a thousand barrels a day, which for ExxonMobil is with one, they don't qualify, but two, it would not be very important on their overall production. Now that would be very important for the small independent producer who diversifies, if you will, prevents the monopoly of the super majors and the larger independents. So how essential is such a thing for that smaller producer who is creating such prosperity for working Americans in your state? Thanks for the question, Senator. Um, our natural gas resources have been a huge win for the economy and environment, but it's a challenge price environment because of infrastructure constraints and regulate, uh, regulations. So the folks that are that are still able to sustain are those independents, um, but their business structure is 80, 80 85 percent of their capex uh, is intangible drilling costs. That's what we call it for that industry. In other industries, it's so. Let uh, me just stop because I have limited yeah. time. So the sure. point is is all these folks who are providing great paying jobs for working Americans, great paying jobs that have persisted despite the pandemic, they are dependent upon this particular provision, which doesn't go to ExxonMobil, but does go to these very small companies in some cases, and they're the ones providing this employment. I wanna make that point. Uh, Mr. Brill, I'm always interested in the carbon tax because it seems as if it leaves various things out by the way i think philosophically you and i are in agreement on many things but we know let's just be honest we're not going to have battery production on the scale that is required for this vision of the administration for at least a decade if not a lot longer now and we also know that currently most of the batteries are produced in china where they use coal as feedstock and the cobalt is mined in the Congo with abhorrent conditions, a very energy intensive process. So when we do a, uh, and I've read that if you take into account the mining of the cobalt, the processing in China and the shipment of the battery to the US, that the amount of savings in life cycle cost on global greenhouse gas emissions is minimal and perhaps even non-existent. So as we do a, and by the way, hear that, it is minimal or non-existent. So everybody who looks at EVs as kind of the savior of the environment is looking at US emissions. They're not looking at global greenhouse gas emissions. And if we had more time, we could develop that further. Uh, Mr. Brill though, in your carbon tax, aren't we effectively outsourcing the carbon release to China and India, et cetera, uh, unless we're going to put a border adjustment tax, which takes into account the mining of the cobalt in uh, with the equipment that is used in the Congo, the shipping cost to China, the concrete that's laid in China, et cetera. Uh, uh, is that practical? 
Uh, th thank you for your question, Senator. You're absolutely right that in a well-designed carbon tax, there needs to be a border adjustment mechanism um, that would exclude the tax on U.S. exports of carbon intensive goods and impose that tax on imports of goods containing carbon from, from other countries. Um, that policy is something that, that tax lawyers and tax economists have thought about a lot and it can protect the U.S. competitiveness. No, I, so so uh, we accept, I accept, we both accept the need for the border adjustment tax. Is it practical if you're going to have heavy equipment in the Congo, which is going to be, you know, scraping this out of the ground, putting it in a diesel spewing truck to take it to the port, to ship it to China with a 60% coal fired energy source and then shipped over here, uh, not to mention the fact that the factories in China are made with lots of concrete and other vessels, other trucks spewing uh, diesel. How practical is it to have a BAT which totally captures all that? Uh, my view, Senator, is that it is uh, definitely possible to to capture most of the trade in carbon emissions from now, a border Now, just for tax. a second, Mr. Brill, everything's possible. Is it practical? I mean, are yes. we really going to get the diesel truck that's 20 years old in the Congo uh, uh, bringing the stuff used, used by child labor to the port? I'm not suggesting that it can capture 100% of the carbon emissions involved in trade, but I do believe that, it's, that one could practically design a policy that captures the vast majority of traded carbon emissions. I'm over United time, States. but I will say that it's in the interest of our trading partners to bury those costs. And so I do think the practicality of it may be subject to definition. But thank you all for your, uh, for your testimony. Thank you, uh, Senator Cassidy. Next will be Senator Brown. I'm going to run and vote. And uh, Senator Crapo will keep this hearing moving, and I will vote and be right back. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Wyden and Senator Crapo. Uh, Mr. Walsh, the, the, the uh, Banking and Housing Committee, which I chair um, last uh, last week, had the pleasure of hearing from Zoe, Zoe Lippman of BGA. We talked about the potential for my state as a nation shifts to a low carbon economy. Where do you see, uh, Mr. Walsh, where do you see the most potential job growth in domestic manufacturing? Well, I think, thank you for the question, Senator. I, I think certainly uh, in uh, component parts and assembly of, of uh, EV vehicles, there's an enormous amount of work to be done. We've talked a little bit about how the tax code could be used uh, to support EV production uh, in, in this country. We also have direct investment via Department of Energy programs that we can use. I, I think we need to reflect on the fact that and it's been commented on China controls roughly 60% uh, of EV car production, uh, roughly 70% of battery cell production. That was not accidental. That, that was the result of, of focused industrial policy, which included roughly $60 billion worth of investment from the Chinese government. I, I think we also have the ability to make uh, key uh, materials like steel and cement in lower carbon ways. And I think this is an area where we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we have been doing um, uh, a, a bunch of work with different policy models that can, uh, I, I think, better reward U.S. manufacturers vis-a-vis uh, -vis our international competitors. I think it's worth noting uh, that every ton uh, of steel uh, made in, in China has, has roughly twice the embodied emissions Compared to the embodied, compared to the steel made in the United States. So if, I think if we can have policy design that that actually takes that into account, we're going to set up U.S. manufacturers of all, a wide range of materials that are the fundamental building blocks uh, of this country and the world into account. Well, you talk about the, industri the existence of industrial policy in China, and I would add the lack of an industrial policy in the United States, coupled with uh, presidents of both parties from George Bush the first through. Uh, th through Donald Trump and uh, trade policy and a tax policy that that undermined our our efforts too. You note that the union density in the traditional energy sector likely accounts for the wage differential um, between it and the renewable sector. Why are we seeing this? How do we increase wages in solar and wind, whether it's in the factory or whether it's in the field? Yeah, yeah. I think there are a couple of reasons. Um, one. One of the reasons is that one of the most important deployment drivers of, of clean energy technologies like solar and wind has been uh, the tax code. And we have, at least historically, not included 
labor standards or domestic content standards uh, in, in our clean energy tax incentives, we think that needs to change to level that wage gap and that union density gap. And, uh, and, and Senator Wyden's bill, uh, I, I think, shows us uh, a, a good first step. So, so if I could uh, interrupt, so Mr. Welsh, you, 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 you don't, in other words, you don't provide clean energy tax incentives without, or energy tax incentives, period, without some kind of labor standards and some kind of domestic content standards. That that is that is what that is what we believe, Senator. I, I think it's also worth noting that that alone uh, is not enough. That we need to fundamentally rebalance uh, power uh, between workers and their employers in this country. We need to support uh, and reinforce workers' ability to organize uh, amongst themselves to collectively bargain with their uh, employers for better wages and benefits and working conditions. Uh, the PRO Act uh, is, uh, I think, a very important piece of legislation that that our coalition, all of our partners, supports, and and we're we're hoping to see support from from the U.S. Senate of the PRO Act because that, to our minds, is, is critical as we build out this clean energy economy, but also important to addressing uh, what what is fairly profound income inequality in our economy as a whole. Uh, thank you. And the, the Blue Green Alliance has partnered with many Ohio and other Appalachian shareholders, or state, I'm sorry, stakeholders and opportunities to clean up the legacy of extractive industries. What sort of work, and I, I see Senator Bennett, who's going to be in the same meeting I'm in on child tax credit in a moment. Um, what 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 sort of work do we need do, needs to be done there? Uh, well, we 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 have a lot of cleanup that needs to be done. Um, just in looking at abandoned mine lands, you know, some estimates go as high as twenty billion dollars of cleanup costs. Um, this is heavy construction work. It's it's moving a lot of earth uh, with with prevailing wages. We think uh, th these jobs can support uh, middle class jobs and careers, and, and importantly, can be a an important source of job creation in in parts of the country uh, that have been hurt economically by the transitions going on in our energy economy. So we're extremely supportive of cleanup, both uh, on abandoned mine lands, but, but also uh, on, on brownfields, on Superfund sites, and oil and gas wells as well. The, the, the job you. creation potential is really significant. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Thank you very much. Next is Senator Lankford, and he'll be followed by Senator Bennett. Thank you very much. Let, let me um, ask a couple of questions. Mr. Sunday, I want to first start with you talking about tax policy on this. Uh, Europe and Germany in particular uh, is losing some of its energy independence of late uh, by trying to be more dependent on Russia and the Nord Stream 2 pipeline for natural gas. Uh, that's going to be an enormous geopolitical shift. That will be a very long-term effect on Western Europe. Uh, we in the United States started exporting natural gas uh, half a decade ago, uh, specifically dealing with the geopolitical importance of that and also deal uh, with the carbon issues of trying to be able to reduce carbon usage around the world by using cleaner natural gas around the world for energy. So geopolitically, it's important. Otherwise, it's important as well. Uh, the reason I want to be able to drill down that, one of the key issues has been the intangible drilling costs on that, which are just normal operating costs uh, for oil and gas and for their production. There's been conversation about that. Mr. Sunday, what would that mean to lose intangible drilling costs, both geopolitically for us and our energy independence uh, domestically, as well as just in tax policy? Thanks for the question, Senator. Um, it, would, it would incredibly disadvantage the producers that are still able to um, operate here in Pennsylvania. Uh, that would translate to reduced production, fewer jobs. We'd see a uh, reduction in the LNG exports to countries, as you mentioned, in Southeast Asia, India, um, it would increase their geopolitical risk and our ability to shrug off uh, geopolitical turmoil in, in the Gulf. So let me ask the same type of question. Enhanced oil uh, recovery has been a process that's been around for a while. It's been very important to actually reduce our footprint. Sunday, do you want to be able to do any additional details on enhanced oil recovery, what that could mean uh, for continuing to be able to reduce our carbon footprint? Sure, I think if the goal is reduced emissions, you want to get uh, the most molecules out of the ground with the least surface activity possible. So that's certainly something that we would want to continue to support if that's our goal. Okay. Um, thank you for both of those. Uh, Mr. Brill, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, the wind production tax credit. And the issue is not whether we should engage in wind. Wind is a great source of energy uh, around the country. 
Uh, and it's an effective piece of energy when the wind is actually blowing uh, to be able to engage in that. My question is, we still continue to put billions of dollars into the wind production tax credit as a specific set aside to incentive new construction on that. Uh, it obviously changes the formula of the price for wind compared to everything else. Uh, but it, it seems to be something that uh, should be fading. There's lots of great wind production out there. It's very efficient. We're doing it the same way, though, that we've done it for now 30 years. Uh, is it effective to continue to do the same credit over and over again, even when wind is no longer a startup entity? Uh, thanks for the question, Senator. It is true that the, uh, that the technology has advanced um, by leaps and bounds over the next few decades, and the price of wind energy has plummeted over the same period of time. Um, uh, depending on how one does the calculations, um, it is often um, cost competitive, uh, even without the subsidies. The subsidies, of course, um, further encourage additional investment and additional deployment of a, of a carbon neutral source of energy, and, and there are, are climate and economic advantages to that. Um, but continuing a strategy of large subsidies for all clean energy uh, will become increasingly costly over time. Um, as we continue the transition um, towards lower carbon emissions. Um, and, and so therefore the, the cost of these policies, I think should be carefully examined. Thank you, Mr. Pope. I wanna be able to ask you specifically about an issue that I don't think you were directly affected by, um, but uh, two months ago, uh, obviously we had a really deep cold snap that came across the central part of the United States. I was in that Southwest Power Pool, had a pretty dramatic shift during that time period as we saw uh, a lot of wind towers that froze up. We, our solar panels were all covered in deep snow. Uh, a lot of our natural gas uh, facilities that were actually doing gas processing froze up in the central part of the United States. We had a pretty dramatic set of issues there and it seemed to cascade. Uh, part of the challenges we're trying to be able to go through is to continue to be able to focus on energy diversity. Uh, some of the tax incentives, when you put those in place, obviously capital run towards where it's gonna, they're gonna get the greatest return. Uh, that's been wind, that's been other things, which again, in my part of the country in Oklahoma, the wind comes sweeping down the plain and we actually turn wind towers with it and make energy out of it. It's been great as a source, uh, but the question becomes over-reliance and on peak days, uh, what that really means to have an over-reliance. How can tax policy actually push us in, in our energy diversity area that we over-create uh, some areas and under-supply others? And so on peak days, hot and cold, we miss that out. How do you balance that out in your own portfolio? Thank you very much for the question. And uh, first of all, uh, in Oregon and across the Pacific Northwest, we saw tremendous weather, particularly the last two weeks of February. Um, and in Portland in general, in particular, we had more than half of our customers out of power uh, during that time. And I spent time speaking with uh, Chairman Wyden, as well as many others, uh, in getting that power restored. One of the things that did not happen during the significant ice, wind, and snowstorms um, in our part of the country uh, is that generation continued um, to produce, whether that be wind, uh, whether that be solar, whether that be hydro, or whether that be thermal resources. One of the reasons for that is that those resources are all constructed uh, for the weather conditions that we have in the Pacific Northwest on the hottest days of the year and on the very, very coldest days of the year. Uh, the storms that we were impacted by were probably one in 40 year events. So I am very aware of the um, reliability issues and the problems uh, for all of our customers and community members um, and your constituents uh, when there's not power, particularly during a pandemic. Um, as we look forward to how do we incent diversity across all of our resources, it's something we feel very strongly about. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that we really like the tech neutral aspects of Chairman Wyden's proposals, um, and most importantly, that all participants, utilities and independent power producers alike can participate. Um, and thirdly, I'd say that to balance renewables, uh, wind, solar, hydro, uh, as well as others, uh, Portland General, as, many, as well as many utilities in the West, belong to uh, the energy imbalance market. Um, and we uh, work with each other to lower the cost of renewables uh, to be able to use the max amount of renewables uh, across a much wider geography, the entire West. Uh, so through a variety of mechanisms, I think there's a real opportunity uh, to expand the use of renewables in a reliable and low cost fashion. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sherman.
Thank you, Senator Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for running an excellent hearing, and and thank you to the witnesses for your testimony, Ms. Pope. Um, Cleaning up electricity generation is critical to meeting our climate goals, as we've discussed this morning. It's responsible for 30% of the greenhouse gas pollution in this country. The clean electricity will also be critical to reducing emissions in other sectors like transportation. And while we've made important progress already, without new policy, the electric power sector is poised to reduce emissions roughly 45% below 2005 levels by 2030. Analysis after analysis shows that this sector is where the fastest and cheapest opportunities to cut emissions remain. These studies also show we need to reduce emissions from electricity by at least 80% below 2005 levels by the end of the decade to reach our economy-wide uh, climate targets. I was really encouraged to see a group of leadership, leading power companies, including yours, Ms. Pope, recently release a letter calling for a new, new policy to limit electricity sector emissions to that level nationwide. And as we've heard, Portland General Electric recently upgraded its corporate greenhouse gas reductions goal, pledging to reduce emissions 80% by 2030. At the same time, your company has supported public policy efforts, both in Oregon and federally, that would provide certainty around the emissions reductions necessary from both the power sector and, and economy-wide. Can you talk about the role of policy frameworks that limit carbon emissions from electricity, such as a clean electricity standard, like the one currently under consideration in the Oregon legislature, and how they can be a critical complement to Chairman Wyden's tech neutral bill and help ensure we meet our climate goals? Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, first of all, Senator Bennett, let me. Uh... Uh, mentioned that uh, one of the reasons that we have been successful in achieving the goals that we have and being able to set more aggressive goals as we go forward is the utility sector across the United States works closely together, uh, shares best practices, in particular, uh, your state of Colorado uh, and how you manage uh, wind energy, uh, integrate uh, that not only from the IOUs, but from your public power uh, participants in this state has been an example to us for many years. So thank you. Um, we believe very strongly that state policy and federal policy need to work hand in hand with one another. And we view that these are complementary uh, and will help us move faster uh, and meet all needs. We've seen in the past that when there is a disconnect between federal and state policies, it can be challenging for utilities, particularly those that operate in different states and different parts of the country, and we don't move as fast uh, towards a clean energy future. So having more certainty, um, having tech neutral approaches, um, and allowing all participants to be able to work collaboratively together uh, as we make this do this important work to hit 80% reductions from the electric sector so that our broader economy could hit uh, 50 percent reductions by 2030 and then go beyond uh, with more technology advancements to 2035 or 2040. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can't see a clock, so I, I don't know what I have left. I, you I have about know. a minute and a half, about Great. a minute and a half left. Excellent. So, Mr. Walsh, uh, workers and communities in, in coal-dependent regions across our country are struggling to make ends meet. And in order to safeguard our environment, health, and economy, we need to transition to cleaner sources of energy to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And we need to do this, as you've said, while ensuring there are good paying jobs for energy workers. We've also got to support communities that rely on local government revenue from fossil fuels to support core services like education, water, and public safety. I have in mind places like Craig, Colorado, in, in my own state. Uh, Mr. Walsh, in terms of tax policy, what lessons uh, should Congress learn from experiences in states or cities or even at particular facilities on how to support workers and communities in transition, especially in, in rural communities like um, Moffat County or like Craig, Colorado? Thank you for the question, Thanks. Senator. Uh, I mean, I think I think we can start by learning from from your state of Colorado, um, where we see a great example of a coordinated whole of state government approach to using public investment to support workers and communities uh, in the coal economy, uh, Craig and Moffat County being a big part of that in Northwest Colorado. 
I think they'd be the first to tell us, though, that that states uh, can't do this by themselves, that they need the federal government as a partner and, and a and a whole of uh, government approach from the federal government. You, you note ways in which we can potentially use the tax code. We've already talked a little bit about how legislation can target new uh, investment in manufacturing and infrastructure to communities that have been uh, disrupted by coal economy transition, the, the 48C uh, proposal from Senator Stabenow and Senator Manchin is, is one such example. Uh, you do flag, though, the importance of uh, local tax revenue that comes from uh, facilities like coal power plants and coal mines. I, I think this is something we really need to explore. Uh, I think as, as a coalition, we would be very interested with working you, with working with you and, and other folks uh, on the committee to figure out how we can most reasonably help uh, local uh, and state and tribal governments replenish revenue they've lost when, for example, a coal mine uh, or power plant closes. Uh, I, I think there's a strong role uh, in, in that for this committee and, and the federal tax code. I agree with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And next is Senator Daines. Thanks, Senator Crapo. Um, instead of investing in coal strip and the high paying jobs it creates, PG&E and the other Pacific Northwest owners have done everything they could to avoid investing in the plant. It's in part because of statewide carbon-free mandates in Oregon and Washington, and the early closure of coal strip will have huge, huge impacts on the community, on jobs, and reliable baseload power in the region. It's one thing to be forced to close because of state policies, but it's another to actively advocate for them. Ms. Pope, has PG&E been party to any communication directed to Washington or Utility Commission urging the immediate closure of Coal Strip? Thank you, Senator Daines. Um, and um, we reflect uh, in, as an Oregon utility the values of our customers um, and the values of community leaders in the state in which we serve and operate. Um, the operation at Coal Strip um, has, we've been an owner of that facility uh, for, since its inception um, and are committed to doing the right thing for employees, for the community of Coal Strip, um, and um, for the environment. Uh, we're working collaboratively with the and other- Pope, just, just the, the question was, has PG&E been a part of any communication directed to Washington or Utility Commission urging the immediate closure of Coal Strip? We have not engaged with the Washington Utility Commission. We are governed by the Oregon Utility Commission. But I have Washington or Oregon. So Oregon, you have? Our, our Oregon Commission, um, we have a, um, uh, a in the utility regulation, uh, it includes uh, not having coal, uh, coal in our customer prices by 2030. And so then, if you, um, regarding the Oregon Utility Commission, so you've, and a part of urging the immediate closure of close up with the Oregon Utility Commission. Uh, we have we are working collaboratively with stakeholders to figure out a solution um, that is uh, reflects the values of Oregon customers, community leaders, uh, and others across the state, as well as customer prices. Uh, making sure that we're doing the right thing for the employees of Coal Strip, uh, working collaboratively with other owners and our contractual relationships there. Um, as well as the communities in Montana that have supported the facility for the decades that it's been operating. So regarding serving your customers, um, as you know, the Pacific Northwest has a looming capacity shortage with the possibility that baseload power will not be able to meet peak demand. We saw this happen, of course, in California last summer. Would extending and expanding clean energy credits address that problem or would it make it worse due to increased intermittent energy and decreased baseload? As we look forward to a clean energy future, using technology to integrate new technologies of renewable energy, but battery storage, also traditional storage of pumps, uh, hydro, uh, as well as others. We also are working to ensure that we have distributed energy resources um, that will allow us to use more flexibly managed load uh, and customer usages so that we're able to take advantage of a diverse set of energy resources, wind, solar, hydro, and others. And in particular, we're looking at investments in the state of Montana around wind energy and solar energy. 
So I know Oregon's legislature is considering a bill to require PG&E to service Oregon customers with 100% clean energy by 2040, I believe. Um, is that something your company supports? And we have been in dialogue with the parties with regards to legislation currently in front of um, the Oregon legislature on both the House and the Senate side. So PG&E relies on output from Coal Strip to uh, reliably serve load. The economics of operating the plant have been changed in part by renewable tax subsidies. If that continues, Coal Strip's continued operation could be put in further jeopardy. This would result in displacing of an entire community and remove the, from the regional facility that has served to maintain regional grid reliability. Question is, what do you think we should do as part of this legislation to enable PG&E to exit Coal Strip? while enabling others to continue to own and operate the plant to supply, certainly a state like Montana, and aid regional grid stability. So there are a number of owners in the coal strip facility um, who have different interests and some interests that are aligned and working through the contractual relationships, both as owners and uh, with operators to find a workable solution for the plant um, is important. We'll make sure that uh, we will do the right thing by the plant employees who've worked there uh, for a long time, um, the operations, uh, as well as the environment uh, and the community of Coal Strip. As you note, there's um, uh, two of the units have already closed uh, and we've worked collaboratively uh, as those costs um, have um, been incurred by the other co-owners of the, of the other units. Um, and we continue to um, meet regularly to discuss the, the operations of the facility. Thanks, Ms. Pope. Uh, Senator Crapo, thanks. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. And next is Senator Casey, and he'll be followed by Senator Young if he's able to get back, and Senator Warner. Senator Casey. Senator Crapo, thanks very much. I'll have a question, I hope, for both uh, Mr. Walsh and Mr. Sunday. Mr. Walsh, I wanted to start with you in your written testimony. You noted how important it is that we seek out ways to build career pathways in order to, to increase access to clean energy jobs. Uh, I agree, and I know a lot of people do as well. And we, we got, at the same time, we have to look to address the, the climate crisis as well as addressing the uh, economic and jobs crises that we're confronting right now. We must also prioritize training and skill development opportunities so obviously this has to include um, pathways to good jobs. And I believe uh, one of the best pathways to a good job is uh, union jobs for new workers, as well as workers seeking new opportunities within the energy sector. I have a, a civilian conservation core proposal that I've been working on. Um, while it's not limited to energy jobs, it prioritizes opportunities for civilian conservation core uh, to not only obtain short-term employment, but also to gain both skills and connections as well as opportunities that will help them uh, set up for the long-term. So here's the question. As we look to advance policies, including through the tax code that will expand both the clean energy sector, what steps should we be taking to ensure that training programs, uh, whether it's registered apprenticeships or pre-apprenticeship programs, uh, what what steps should we be taking to ensure that, uh, that we're focused on the broader goal of creating new clean energy jobs? Uh, th thank you for the question, Senator Casey. Uh, we agree that uh, unions and the registered apprenticeship and union affiliated training programs they create with their signatory employers are a key pathway to, to doing that. Um, I, I, you, you mentioned your conservation core proposal that, for example, could be used as a pathway into registered apprenticeship programs. Uh, the, the, the key is to make sure that we have incentives within, uh, our, our tax, uh, credits to, to actually leverage those existing assets. Right? So, uh, for example, uh, Senator Wyden's inclusion of registered apprenticeship utilization in his bill is a way to do that. We have other ways to do that as well. We, we can uh, incent or require project labor agreements, um, which, which come with them uh, a, a typically on large project, a very sophisticated plan uh, on uh, not only the use of registered apprentices on those projects, but then 
the pathway that usually starts with a pre-apprenticeship program, often based in a local community, so that folks actually have the skills they need to get into those apprenticeships and therefore on a pathway to a what, what ultimately becomes a career track middle class job. So uh, I, I think intentionality about the standards we apply to tax credits is, is the key. And we look forward to working with you and working with this committee to expand on some of the good first steps that Senator Wyden has made in including registered apprenticeship and prevailing wage uh, in his legislation. Mr. Walsh, thank you very much. I'll move to Mr. Sunday with regard to uh, kind of three interrelated issues, methane, jobs, and infrastructure. In your testimony, you referred to the need to take steps to both reduce methane emissions from natural gas, but also uh, the potential that it has. Methane, as we know, is a terribly powerful uh, greenhouse gas. Its effect on climate change is more than 30 times greater than that of CO2 when average over a hundred year time period, and even greater when considered over the first uh, 20 years after it's emitted. We know that in my home state of Pennsylvania, this is a real, this opportunity, I should say, is a real win-win to help address methane leaks from natural gas, natural gas production, but also to protect and create new jobs um, at the same time we're addressing climate. You noted the significance of uh, pipeline infrastructure in this question. So I guess just asking you to speak to the economic opportunity for a state like ours um, with regard to further investments in methane leak detection and repairs at all stages um, and whether this is a good opportunity to create good paying jobs and, and taking steps on lowering emissions. Sure. Thanks for the question, Senator. I think you got um, the upstream stage where drillers are committing to net zero uh, uh, corporate sustainability goals, same with the pipelines. Downstream on the utility side with a lot of aging infrastructure, we got to figure out a way to replace some of those leaks and aging mains and not uh, sock rate payers. And then we can't forget about the contributions from methane from abandoned oil and gas wells, as which, as you know, we have some estimates, several hundred thousand of them scattered across the state. We need to find a viable way to get those things plugged. Thanks very much. All right, next is Senator Young. Is he back? Senator Young, are you here? I see Senator Warner. You are next, <laughs> Senator Warner. Thank you, Senator Crapo, and my apologies to, to Senator Young. Uh, thanks for this hearing. Um, I'm going to have a question, a couple of questions for Mr. Walsh. Um, here in Virginia, we are um, taking bold steps to modernize our energy economy, uh, particularly through the development of offshore wind. Uh, the Commonwealth is currently in the midst of developing a 2.6 gigawatt um, commercial offshore wind project in federal waters, and that'll be the first in federal waters. It will be when fully operational, capable of providing clean renewable energy to about 650,000 homes. Um, as I mentioned, it's currently the largest uh, project in in uh, in federal waters. The Global Wind Energy Council has said that the outlook for wind energy is going to ramp uh, exponentially. Matter of fact, in looking at 13,000 megawatts in 2024 and over 20,000 megawatts in 2025. All this is good news, but that also means there's more competition for capital. Um, there's there's going to be a lot more focus here. You know, Mr. Walsh, what can this committee and the administration do to make sure that the United States okay. is more uh, successful in both attracting domestic and international capital? And how can we make sure that uh, uh, we maintain that that supply chain. One of the things we're trying to do in Virginia is make sure that some of those wind turbines are actually made in Virginia as they help produce wind for Virginians and others. But could you help help address that question around supply chain? And since Senator Crapo uh, didn't mute himself and is over talking, uh, I'm going to probably get an extra 30 seconds or so out of that. But thanks for letting me know, Mark. I <laughs> mute myself and you can't. Um, Mr. Walsh, can you? Can you take thank that you. on supply chain on wind? Yeah, yeah. Uh, th th thank you for, for the question, Senator. We we agree with you. The the economic potential of offshore wind is, is truly dramatic. And, and we have a great example from the first grid connected offshore wind farm in this country uh, in Block Island off of Rhode Island of how uh, unionized craftspeople from a whole set of building trades under a project labor agreement built 
that that wind farm. Uh, the, the only place where it fell short, and this gets to your question, is, is in the materials and the technologies that were actually used for, for the wind turbines, right? The nacelles came uh, from France, the towers came from Spain, uh, and the blades came from Denmark. Um, we can do better than that. What, one of the ways uh, to do that is to include domestic content incentives or requirements uh, in our offshore wind uh, production tax credit. Uh, another way to do that is, is uh, on the supply side, uh, because um, to, to make the, the kind of components for offshore wind that are gonna be necessary, size and scale is enormously important. There are going to be big capital expenditures going into that, for example, to make one of those blades by, by domestic manufacturers. Uh, and, and we think on the we're, we're going to need some supply side uh, help for U.S. manufacturers to actually become competitive in what will be an enormously uh, important economic opportunity. Uh, you've seen the data that we have. The National Renewable uh, Energy Laboratory estimates that the Atlantic Coast states could create roughly $200 billion in new economic opportunities. So we want to make sure that, that we capture those benefits, not just on the installation and operation and maintenance, that's important, but also in the manufacturing supply chain as well. Well, as we get into that, um, one of the things that we need to guarantee is there's going to be that domestic demand. And as, as you may be aware, um, you know, we got approved in Virginia, but there's a lot of other offshore wind projects stacking up in terms of getting um, BOEM to make the the approval process. You know, uh, we want to make sure these are all environmentally sound. But you know, if we don't have a faster approval process, if we don't literally. There was so much dismantling done under the previous administration and just the administrative oversight. If we don't get these projects approved on a timely basis, we're not going to have the kind of uh, uh, guaranteed domestic generation that will then move some of those European com companies to say, well, you know, we need to actually build some of those turbines and blades here in the United States. Can, in their last 24 seconds, can you speak to that issue of getting uh, this approval process speeded up a little bit? We, we completely agree with you. Um, efficiency and transparency of per permitting is gonna be really important. Uh, as well, fully as as fully attending to environmental mitigation issues. I, I mean, we've had direct conversations with Director Lefton at Bohm. I, I think she shares that vision and is committed to making sure that Bohm uh, uses all the resources at its disposal uh, to make sure that that permitting do it's done in an expeditious and thorough way. As you note, uh, you know, ca capital expenditures are going to be absolutely reliant on that kind of certainty. Uh, otherwise, we're we're not going to see manufacturers and developers and other businesses in the value chain make the kind of investments necessary to capture this economic opportunity. And that's again where I think I know my time's expired, but that's where I think again, uh, my Republican colleagues, this is an area where I think there was agreement that we need a faster regulatory review and approval process, and Bohm needs the the resources to get that done. Thank you, Senator Crapo. Thank you, Senator Warner. And I do see Senator Whitehouse. Senator Whitehouse, you're next. Thanks, Senator Crapo. I appreciate it. And thanks to uh, all the witnesses. Since uh, Mark raised the question of BOEM, let me just flag that one of the reasons Rhode Island got steel in the water and electrons on the grid first is because we did two very smart things that hadn't been done before. One was get a very robust data plan together so that everybody knew who was doing what in the waters where the uh, siting was to take place. And the second is we front loaded the use conflicts. And we got those resolved or minimized at the very get-go. And Boehm, despite that, has not learned that lesson yet. And so, Mr. Walsh, I would urge you and Mark and everybody else to join me in pushing to have Boehm require applicants when they come in with these projects to have done a conflicting use survey and report to Boehm what conversations they've had with the other users so that you don't end up with warfare breaking out between conflicting users that could have been headed off uh, and instead slows things down. So um, I'll just flag that issue because I think we have real common cause there. Um, some background on this, you know, I think um, the fossil fuel industry has known for decades about this problem. They've had every chance to deal responsibly with the pollution. Uh, 
We could have robust technologies for dealing with carbon in place, but instead the industry chose to set up front groups and traffic in lies and uh, attack the real scientists and use immense amounts of dark money to influence politics. In effect, they ran a big covert operation against their own country to try to prevent the action that we're trying to push for now. And I think they need to be held accountable for that, plain and simple. Uh, moreover, the rest of corporate America, there's been a lot of talk about how the rest of corporate America supports a lot of what we're talking about, kinda. I mean, they do when they're meeting as BRT and CLC, but when they come to this building, when it's their lobbyists and their trade associations, that support has evaporated. So please, nobody watching this should think that there is effectual corporate support, particularly for carbon pricing in Congress right now. They just aren't doing it. And I don't know if because the CEOs don't know what their posture is or because they want to stick with the trade associations who've been so much trouble. But whatever it is, the effect is there is simply no real business pressure for carbon pricing at this point. Um, and the last point I'd make is you can't talk about natural gas emissions without talking about methane. And methane has been a nightmare and the industry has been very sloppy about reporting and has backed away from commitments to report. So we have a lot of work to do to get the methane uh, problem solved. And I think there are a lot of jobs in solving the methane problem. So let me turn to just a couple of quick questions. One is uh, to Mr. Brill. Uh, Mr. Brill, the IMF has put the subsidy for fossil fuel in the United States at $600 billion, billion per year which obviously includes the negative externalities and not just the direct subsidies we're addressing today. Is that an economically correct way to look at the subsidy for fossil fuel, the IMF way? Uh, well, I wouldn't attribute that subsidy to the industry. I would agree that there are um, uh, negative externalities associated with the emissions of CO2 emissions. And that's the reason why a carbon tax can help um, move the economy, the energy economy away from fossil fuels and towards alternative energies and clean energies. And you're aware of the IMF report that puts the number at 600 billion with the uh, negative I have not seen that report. Okay, I'll get, take a look. Um, I think Mr. Sunday, uh, Mr. Brill and Mr. Walsh all in their testimony supported carbon capture and removal. Um, I'd love to offer Ms. Pope the chance to make it unanimous. Um, and I would note that um, it's hard to get much carbon capture and removal going if just dumping it into the atmosphere is free. There's not much of a revenue proposition for carbon capture and removal until there is a price on emissions. And so I think those of us who support carbon capture and removal as an essential way to safety in all of this and need to think about it in those terms. Um, Mr. Bill, would you agree with that? And Ms. Pope, how do you feel about uh, carbon capture and removal? I would agree, yes. Ms. Pope? Um, and Senator, yes, we would agree. Uh, we also believe that we need to have a combination of policies and some yeah. of the lessons. Yeah, there's no market. single, it's it's a silver buckshot, not silver bullet, I think is the way we describe it. Thanks. Last thing, Mr. Brill, you talk about making progress globally. Uh, with a price on carbon, that would be consistent with global progress, you say, but it would also facilitate global progress through border adjustments because nothing is easier to reconcile in a border adjustment than international prices on carbon. Isn't that true? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question, Senator. Like if different countries have completely different regulatory systems for ah. regulating carbon emissions, that's hard to figure out at the border who should pay what. But if one country has $100 per ton and the other has a $50 per ton, figuring out what the border adjustment should be gets a lot easier. Absolutely. Many of our regulatory policies are not and cannot be border adjusted, but a carbon tax can be border adjusted. And your point is absolutely correct. And that's how you get to global progress. Thank you very much, everybody. Great hearing. Much appreciated. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Next is Senator Young. Is Senator Young back? I'll just explain to the witnesses, we got a series of votes going on, and so members are having a hard time getting back. Chairman. Oh, I see, the, I see the chairman back now. Ranking member. I'm sorry. Oh, wait, uh, Senator Young's next, and then I'll turn the gavel back over to, to uh, the chairman. 
Thank you, Senator Crapo. And there is a vote on Senator Young. I'm headed to vote. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, very well engineered and, and choreographed. Okay. Uh, well, I, I thank our witnesses for joining us uh, today. Uh, and um, this is, it's really important we hold this hearing today. So I, I commend the Chairman for doing that. Despite being considered a promising carbon alternative for years now, hydrogen hasn't seen national investment like other nationally sort of important renewable energy sources. In the meantime, innovators have been expanding the uses of hydrogen, while global investors have directed over $100 billion toward hydrogen infrastructure. To ensure that the United States is rightly leveraging this resource, last week I reintroduced a piece of legislation, the Hydrogen Sustainability and Utilization Act, along with Senator Whitehouse. The bill would incentivize investment in hydrogen energy infrastructure by add adding hydrogen to the list of renewables that qualify for the Renewable Electricity Production Tax Credit Mr. Walsh, it's estimated that the growth of hydrogen infrastructure could generate 700,000 jobs in the next 10 years. Now, as we look toward rebounding from the economic impact of this uh, global pandemic, do, do you believe that hydrogen is a worthy federal investment? Thank you for the question, Senator Young. Uh, hydrogen uh, is, uh, I think, enormously important um, as an energy carrier. Uh, it, it is also uh, extremely intriguing for another, a number of other reasons. I'll, I'll just cite steelmaking, given the state that you represent, right? Um, hydrogen is actually being used as a reductant, not in this country, because we don't have a policy regime in place to actually support that, but as a, as a reductant for steelmaking over in Europe right now. So there are a number of really interesting uses, uses for hydrogen. Um, I, I think it's particularly interesting to look at ways in which we can produce green hydrogen using renewable energy sources that are otherwise curtailed uh, in, in off demand cycles to actually uh, to, to create the hydrogen in clean ways. So uh, I, I think this is an issue that we would be very interested in talking with, talking with you further about. The other benefit of hydrogen, of course, is it allows us to use some of our existing infrastructure uh in in lower carbon or even zero carbon ways if done right uh and, and i think that's another benefit that we need to look at as well there are a set of safety and co-pollutant issues associated with hydrogen that i think need to be looked at very very carefully but but i i, I know that's something that you would welcome looking at as well uh you are correct sir thank you for your fulsome response uh so we'll uh, we'll leave behind hydrogen for a moment and um, I'll pivot to another topic, uh, which is uh, renewable energy incentives. And I'm looking for the time clock here. Okay. Uh, this is always a challenge when we're uh, remotely asking questions. So I uh, want to be sensitive to that. So renewable energy incentives, particularly within the tax code, uh, often have unintended consequences. For example, nearly two thirds of solar panel production occurs in China with many more companies sourcing inputs from uh, communist China. With an expansion of demand for more solar panel installation, this means that Americans will have to rely on Chinese manufacturing in order to increase utilization of solar energy. Of course, reshoring solar panel manufacturing is one option, but it will be very capital intensive and time consuming. The disadvantages of relying on China for the supply chain are multifold. Uh, let me just move forward uh, to uh, some questions for Mr. Brill. Mr. Brill, to what extent should we be concerned about the level of dependence on China in our renewable energy supply chains? And what's the role of the federal government in supporting domestic reshoring without causing even more market disruptions? Uh, thank you, Senator Young, for your question. I think it's important that uh, the United States has a diversified supply chain uh, with respect to renewable energies. And so to the extent that uh, that does not necessarily, I should say, that does not necessarily mean that that uh, all of our renewable energy needs to be manufactured here in the United States. But to the extent that we're reliant on a single country, or particularly a country with which we have an, a, uh, an adverse relationship, that does put at risk um, that supply chain, bringing some of that manufacturing onshore or um, ensuring that other countries are capable and, and active in the production of 
solar panels or other technologies, I think is to our advantage. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for the uh, concise response. I, I just add, as I pass it back to the chairman, that uh, I think the federal government uh, should examine the effects of increasing our dependence on China before launching a sweeping policy to further incentivize uh, the use of renewable energy sources. I, th I thank my colleague, and I also want to note uh, that his interest in hydrogen is well taken, and hydrogen would get the same kind of treatment as wind and solar with respect to this effort to reduce emissions, and I thank my colleague. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the panel members. It's a great discussion. Uh, I am one that believes we have to invest in uh, building and modernizing our infrastructure to meet the demands of tomorrow, the 21st century technology. And I think it is going to be key. Otherwise, we're going to be left behind. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the EV infrastructure. And, and I apologize if this question has already been asked. Uh, I know I uh, have had our hearings and had to go vote. But let me just say, I'm very proud of Nevada. Uh, it's leading the way in electric vehicle innovation production. And I am proud to support that. First, by, by joining my colleagues um, uh, in uh, signing on to securing America's Clean Fuels Infrastructure Act to provide incentives to support building the infrastructure that's necessary to support Americans as they move toward electric vehicles. I even have some bills uh, that's focused on uh, incentivizing that new modern technology. But Ms. Pope, let me, let me start with you. H how can uh, bills like these and the Clean Energy for America Act support the growth of EV infrastructure to make drivers' commutes cleaner and more fuel efficient while also driving our global economic competitiveness. Thank you. Uh, there are three main areas that would make a big significant difference. The first uh, is charging infrastructure, uh, making sure that all participants can participate in building out charging infrastructure. The second is overall utility infrastructure, what, what the industry tends to call make ready. Um, and that is ensuring that we have the right equipment in the distribution system all the way to the charging area. Um, and then the third is really around clean energy and being able to charge the vehicles when the sun is blowing, um, excuse me, when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining to make sure uh, that we are maximizing the use of renewables. We can also then begin to use the batteries in the vehicles to return back to the grid for stability. So these uh, the benefits to the transportation sector also accrue to the overall utility customers in making a stronger, more resilient grid. Portland General just uh, launched with a partnership with Daimler North America uh, in a electric uh, island charging area for, um, and um, uh, Senator Cantwell will appreciate this, for heavy duty trucks, medium duty trucks, uh, buses, uh, for um, uh, our uh, local transit authority, as well as school buses. Uh, and that was done just last week and there's tremendous growth in this area, so thank you. Well, thank you. And I, I see that in my own state. Most people don't even know where Love Lock, Nevada is, but I'll tell you what, if you have an electric vehicle and you're traveling across Interstate 80, you know Lovelock, Nevada, because there's a charging station there. And I think it is so important that we make these investments now in the infrastructure that's necessary uh, to utilize the technology that's gonna bring us to um, a, a cleaner environment as well. Um, let me ask this, future investments in our transmission system must prioritize strategic choices that maximize distribution for the consumers and businesses that will rely on it. Uh, so, Ms. Pope, do you have any thoughts on how Congress can clearly define and target transmission investments? Sure. And before I answer your question on transmission, I do want to acknowledge that many of the batteries uh, that are used uh, across the entire West, in fact, across the entire country, are manufactured in Nevada. And I have visited and those facilities. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting that. We are very proud. And, and that's why I say Nevada is primed with its innovation on this new technology really to create jobs, lead in this technological age uh, and contribute economically and reduce our carbon footprint. I'm very proud uh, of all of the work everyone in Nevada has done here, including the private sector that's been instrumental 
uh, in the, this innovation space. But, but please go ahead. Absolutely. And with regards to transmission, um, as we look at the lowest cost resources that are renewable, generally they are very large and they are away from uh, the areas where most electricity is used in urban centers and whatnot. So transmission is absolutely critical. Um, and as you know, across the West and across the rest of the country, we have not kept up with our transmission investments. And as we change our sources of electricity, it will be important that we also invest in transmission. And so whether that is a trans, let's take it as an example, a transformation within um, many states in the West, including Montana, there will need to be additional transmission that is built, but also that we can leverage existing transmission. And some of the transmission projects in Nevada are particularly important in terms of West-wide stability of the grid. So thank you. Thank you. I know my time's up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Senator Cortez Mastro. Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Crapo for holding this hearing. And thank you to our witnesses for testifying today. Um, I wanted to start with a question to you, Ms. Pope. Um, the year end relief package contained my bipartisan bill to increase access to capital for residential and commercial energy storage projects. I'm also a supporter of bipartisan efforts led by Senator Heinrich and others to strengthen tax incentives for energy storage. Ms. Pope, how do battery storage incentives help improve the reliability of the electrical grid and cut costs for consumers? Thank you, Senator Hansen. Uh, battery storage is an absolute critical component to the future of the reliability of our systems, uh, both connected uh, with the generation uh, by renewables, um, as well as uh, for reliability of the distribution system, let's say connected with substations, as well as also an individual homes for reliability and resiliency. And as we look at the grid of the future, we will be able to store solar and wind energy for use during times when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining and be able to have truly a bi-directional integrated, much more reliable grid. For example, Portland General, um, together with Next Era Energy Resources, just brought online the wind portion of the largest uh, scale solar, wind, and battery storage facility in Eastern Oregon. And what that does uh, to the prior discussion on transmission, it allows us to utilize better the transmission that goes across the state um, on more of a 24 seven basis when you otherwise would not be generating because that storage has been able to store the wind, the solar. And in the future with Senator Wyden's bill would be also be able to store the wind. So that's very, very important component as we move forward and technology is moving very quickly. Thank you for that answer. I wanna move now to Jason Walsh. Mr. Walsh, I've introduced bipartisan bicameral, bicameral legislation along with Senator Collins to modernize and expand energy efficiency tax incentives. The energy efficiency sector is one of the largest clean energy employers with millions of workers spread out across every state. Our bills would expand tax credits for homeowners who upgrade appliances and improve incentives for building new energy efficient homes. Can you comment on how promoting energy efficiency can simultaneously create high quality jobs reduce homeowners energy bills and help fight climate change. Thank you for the question, Senator. Well, well, you're right. It, it does all of those things. <laughs> it, it, is, it is a triple win. Uh, the, the only thing I would add to, to, to the very useful way you framed the question, uh, which I completely agree with, is that it is actually the, the if you look at the, the US energy employment report, is it's the energy efficiency jobs are the biggest source of clean uh, energy economy jobs uh, in our entire economy. Uh, there, there is uh, a ton of good building trades work in particular that is done on energy efficiency as we move to more fully deploy energy efficiency resources across the country and across the economy in multiple sectors. The, the job growth potential uh, is really significant. We obviously care a lot about the quality of those jobs and access to those jobs but energy efficiency is enormously important and I'm really glad you asked the question and are such a champion on energy efficiency issues. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question. Uh, I have 
additional legislation, the Net Meter Act, that would support the renewable energy market by helping states expand net metering programs. Net metering allows consumers and businesses to reduce their electric bills by compensating them for renewable energy that they produce and return to the grid. So, Mr. Walsh, can net metering complement our efforts to fight climate change by strengthening solar and wind tax incentives? I, I think it can, Senator. We've done comparatively little work on net metering, but but on, on the legislation you mentioned, we'd be happy to talk with you further and work with you further on that. Thank you very much. Uh, last question to you, Mr. Walsh. The tax code currently hands numerous special tax giveaways to big oil, including the special deductions for oil drilling. How do these special tax giveaways for big oil hurt our efforts to combat climate change and create good paying clean energy jobs? Senator, we, we don't take a position on, on those tax credits. We, we are much more focused on the affirmative tax credits that can be made that invest in energy efficiency and new renewable energy generation and, 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 and doing so in an equitable way. Well, I, I thank you for your care with that answer. I'd suggest uh, that those tax credits um, should um, be um, eliminated as we transfer to clean energy tax incentives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hass and Senator Barrasso. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you taking the time to hold the hearing and involve so many of us. America is energy independent right now. Our nation reached that goal through the hard work of hundreds of thousands of American workers. Securing energy independence provides all Americans with a more safe and a stronger future. Uh, that's why I'm baffled, really baffled, by the efforts of President Biden and his supporters in Congress to destroy entire industries in America and to force tens of thousands of American fossil fuel energy workers into the ranks of the unemployed. Uh, I continually hear the administration tell oil rig workers, coal miners, pipeline workers that they can simply get new jobs building solar panels. Shortly after President Biden took office, John Kerry said the Biden administration policies will give these workers, in his words, better choices. Look, in 2019, the average salary of solar panel technicians was about $30,000 a year, less, $30,000 a year less than the average salary of workers in oil, gas, coal, in all those industries. Uh, that's even if these green jobs even exist. To that point, the Washington Post fact checker uh, took a look at what John Kerry had said. They said he was offering, Kerry and the administration was offering false hope with a misleading use of statistics. America needs all of the energy. We need the solar, we need the wind, we need the oil, we need the gas, we need the coal, we need the uranium for nuclear power, we need it all. And the demands for energy in this country are gonna continue to increase. Choosing to use the tax code to intentionally destroy Americans' fossil fuel industry, to hurt our economy, to force more American workers to lose their jobs and to strengthen the economic power of the government of China, Venezuela, Iran, and Russia is a path I will not go down. Today at the Energy Committee hearing where I'm the ranking member, Joe Manchin and I, uh, were talking with, uh, with those people that were there to testify. Senator Murkowski from Alaska said that right now, Russia is providing more energy to the United States than is Alaska. I mean, what's that going to make Americans feel if they hear that that's the result of the Biden administration? So to, for me, the, the choice is easy. I'm going to continue to be on the side of and support America's fossil energy workers, their families, their communities, all of the things related to it. So a question uh, for Mr. Sunday, following up with Senator Langford's question to you. Uh, Chairman Wyden's tax proposal released last week includes several provisions I think are harmful that are going to raise costs for businesses and for consumers. The provisions threaten the jobs of tens of thousands of American workers. One of these provisions is the elimination of the percentage depletion allowance for oil and gas and coal operations. The allowance has been uh, in the tax code since 1926. The percentage depletion allowance is available to businesses engaged in extraction operations. That's sand, gravel, granite, marble, uh, coal, borax, sulfur, gold, copper, silver, and oil and gas. So for oil and gas operators, the allowance is available to the smallest, usually family-owned oil and gas companies who usually employ anywhere from 10 to 15 workers. Large integrated companies can't claim the deduction, and a producer can only claim the allowance for the first thousand barrels of oil or gas equivalent produced a day. 
So, you know, you can take a look at comparison to the big oil companies that can produce 370 net oil barrels a day. What, what people don't often realize is that the royalty owner can also claim the percentage depletion allowance on their tax return. Royalty owners are a diverse group from the professional investor to retiree, a rancher, farmer, people who receive some little extra income each month to help with ongoing bills. Often, though not always, the payments are small. So I was talking to a royalty owner who mentioned his most recent oil royalty payment for production on land that he owned was about $120 for two months of royalties, period. Doesn't take advantage of the percentage deduction allowance, but eliminating the allowance will likely result in the, well, which has been in, in the well that he's had, which has been producing for nearly 40 years to be shut in. The royalty payment's gonna disappear. No question American workers are gonna lose their jobs. So the question is, what in your opinion will the economic impact be of eliminating of the percentage depletion allowance, particularly as it affects your independent producers as well as individual royalty owners? Thank you. And uh, in the commodity space, we're talking percentage of depletion everywhere else. It's expensing and uh, depreciation that we have bipartisan support for that. So this isn't special to the oil and gas industry. It's just different terminology. Um, making it harder to drill for the commodities that we need to sustain our modern economy is just going to raise costs on households uh, and consumers, leave local governments with fewer revenues for things like conservation in Pennsylvania uh, through our impact fee. There's billions of dollars that come into state government because of energy development. Uh, and the less we drill, the less we're going to have that type of revenue in the state. So with the elimination of this long time business deduction, is it likely to consolidate more control or less control? of oil and gas markets into the hands of the large integrated oil and gas companies. I think it's fair to say you would see uh, continued pressure on the independents. Right. And in the long run, if an industry consolidates into only a handful of companies, what's the economic impact for consumers? Uh, I would I would venture to say they would lose out in that situation, sir. Good. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I assume my time is about up. I don't really see a clock on the on the screen. Okay. Yes. It did my colleague get anything else he wanted to talk about? Your well, time just is one up. Other, thank you. If my time is up, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So, two and a half hours into the hearing, I want to close with what I believe is the clean energy lodestar for our times a job creating free market competition to get to net zero carbon emissions. Now, over the last nearly three hours, senators asked about natural gas, coal, nuclear, conservation, hydrogen, the list goes on and on. And as we wrap up, I want to make it clear that uh, all of those sources, when they capture emissions, fully capture emissions, they would qualify just as wind and solar do under my legislation. In my view, that makes sense for the times, even though to pick up on Senator Barrasso's last uh, comments, nobody would have contemplated something like this as necessary way back in 1926. Now, committee members have brought up a number of areas where they have interests. I think that they're compatible with the legislation that uh, I've uh, authored. And we'll just wrap up by way of saying that writing legislation is about bringing senators together. We're going to do everything we possibly can to do that. But what is uh, non negotiable is just saying that this can wait because that is something given what scientists are saying our country can't afford. So I wanna thank all our guests, special uh, commendation to Ms. Pope because not only was it very helpful to have her testimony, but she got up before all of us in order to be here and we thank her for it because she is home in uh, Oregon. And my final uh, comment is just to remind senators they have uh, one week to submit uh, questions for uh, our witnesses. With that, the Senate Finance Committee is adjourned and I thank all of our guests.